Hello everybody, my name is Mr. Alberto 23 and I just got the Twilight Princess Any% Percent World Record. So I'm going to be doing commentary over the run that I just got. Uh, I explain things to people who don't know so much about this game. And so without further ado, this is the speedrun. So we start off with the run. We can actually skip cutscenes in this game. So uh, anytime we need to skip a cutscene, we can just double tap the start button. That's faster than watching them. What we're going to do is we're going to first, we're going to take this boulder over to the gate over here, and that's going to allow us to clip into the gate. Basically, the boulder prevents us from falling out when we side hop in. And then, with the bonk, it's actually random whether the clip works. So, like, first one, you see it doesn't work. Uh, but uh, eventually, you do clip if you try it enough times. You just got to bonk and hope that you clip through. And then... Uh, when we're on the other side, what we're going to do is soft reset at the same time as avoiding out. And so, uh, that basically, that's frame perfect, that allows me to, instead of voiding out on the, in the regular game, we void out on the title screen, and that gives you control of Link. And then we void out again so that we can save warp. And that, what that's basically doing is I'm now copying over the title screen file. So the, the title screen here that you just play on, that actually occurs on a certain save file. Now we're on that save file and we get access to the properties of whatever it was on the title screen. So first of all, we're, we spawn here for some reason. Uh, we spawn in Farron Woods. I guess that's where the title screen takes place. And there we get different properties. So you also notice Link now has the sword and the shield. So uh, that's so that Link has that for the title screen. The other thing is that Ordon is in a different state now. So uh, when we go back to Ordon later, we'll notice that it's in the advanced state. So that's going to skip a lot of the intro. So normally uh, you're supposed to go through an entire intro. You're supposed to get the slingshot. You're supposed to get the wooden sword. And we're gonna, just going to skip all of that. And uh, immediately we're going to be heading towards the cage to free the child and the monkey that are trapped in the cage. And so this normally supposed, there's supposed to be background music going on like do 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 do. Do, 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 do. And so that is not playing because we never activated that mission, but if you come over to this area, you can still free them. So we're here early. Uh, all the rolls in this game, it's very important to roll frame perfectly. So when I roll, I press the A button. I try to press it on the very first frame available. It's very important up slopes because when you're going up a slope, Link's speed will drop after a lot, even after a single frame, and then you can never get that back for the rest of the time of being on the slope. But when you frame perfectly roll on the slope, you keep your speed for a lot longer, because normally Link rolls a lot slower up slopes, but you can keep that for a lot longer if you frame perfectly roll. So I try to do that as much as possible. So the beginning of the run, just uh, going through these areas, it's actually quite a bit laggy, so it's harder to roll frame perfectly, especially when there's lag. Like right here, it's about to lag quite a bit. And I have to press the A button slower because if you press it too early, then Link doesn't roll. So you can tell if every roll is frame perfect by seeing if the, uh, the HUD in the top right, the buttons, if they stay dim. And right here, what you just see is I I will roll and then wait and then roll again. So that's uh, the fastest way to roll from a startup because from a startup, if you have no speed, you can get a slower speed roll and then walk for a bit and then get a full speed roll. So that just saves a few frames over, over, uh, roll, over chaining all of the rolls together immediately. So a good cage break time is sub four. So definitely a, not the best start. Uh, I, the best I've ever gotten is the 355. So there's a decent bit behind that, but lots of gameplay left. So there's a lot of RNG coming up in the run. The one, the part that we're about to do is hurting all the goats. And the goats have quite a bit of RNG, quite a bit. So the way the goats work is that they, you can move them uh, by getting close to them. How close you have to get to any specific goat for them to move is RNG. So they could be spooked very easily, so you don't have to be very close to them at all. They could be the default, the regular, normal, or you have to get really, really close to them to get them to move. And that can be really, really annoying because that sends them on seemingly random paths sometimes. So you gotta really hope 
that they don't get spooked too early. So I'll show you an example. I guess none of these are getting spooked too early, so it's a bit RNG here. But I'll show you coming up on one of the goats later, you'll see this goat uh, right there on the left. I was nowhere near him, and he, uh, when I whooped, he went into the pin. So that was an example of a goat that got spooked really, really easily. You had to be really far away from him. But you didn't have to be very close at all, and he noticed you. But sometimes you have to get really, really close. So yeah, sub-18 is a pretty good goat's time. The best, I believe, is like a 15, a high 15. So now that that's done, that's another RNG part of the run. You Now we have to, we're going to go to bow. So this is something you're not supposed to be able to do for a long, long time. But the flag for being able to get iron boots from bow, uh, the sumo wrestling, that is supposed to be when you tame Epona, which is after you complete the Elden Twilight and then Epona's on a rampage and then you tame her. Well, because we're playing on the title screen file, that file already has Epona tamed. So now we can just talk to Bo. Now it's interesting here, the text boxes are kind of broken up. Not exactly sure why that is, but basically I have to talk to him over and over and over again to, but eventually he'll cycle through all the text boxes. But that works, no problem. And so we're gonna start the sumo wrestling, and this is another big RNG part of the run. So by RNG, I mean it's a random. So basically, there's there's uh, in the first phase, there's three things Bo can do. He well, there's four things. He can do nothing. He can dodge. He can grab, or he can slap. And we want him to dodge or do nothing. So I'm always gonna go for a slap. And so he slaps, so we kind of just trade. But now he moves to the side, and that slap will hit him. So I can one cycle him off the ledge with a slap. So that's why I always go for a slap first. Uh, but actually grabbing, going for pressing A, so I'm slapping his B. If I press A instead, that's actually a higher chance of working, but it doesn't push him as far. So I actually go for slap first all the time. You hear you want him to dodge, and we got it. So uh, basically, uh, I, I kind of already know mapped out what all the odds are of him doing things. So that's why you want to choose the right option, but even then, the odds aren't that great. Like, it's a 1 in 2 chance first phase that he does what you want him to do, and then it's a 1 in 4 chance that he does what, what you want him to do in the second phase. So it's not that great of odds. So, Decent Iron Boots actually got a gold there. That that gold I had been, uh, I had not been able to get that gold there, which is basically a best segment. The best I'd ever done that segment because I could never get the odds for Bo. But finally I was able to get it this time. So now that we've beaten Bo, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save the game. This is very important for later. I'm gonna save the game in this order on state. This is gonna be used for a trick way, way later. So just keep in mind of this save file. I'm also making sure I fill in all of my save files, so I started with all blank save files, and you want to fill in all your save files because the very first save you do over a blank save file is faster because you don't have the prompt of overwriting the save file, so it saves a bit faster, it saves a few frames throughout the run. As I mentioned, Ordon's already in its completed state, so I really didn't have to do the first boat, the first goats. I didn't have to get the slingshot or the wooden sword or target practice, any of that. And we can just go straight to becoming wolf. So, quite a bit early to be doing this stuff in the run. This is, uh... We're supposed to be... supposed to take a bit longer to do this, but without the intro, you see we're already here at 8... At 8 minutes, we're already turning into Wolf. So there's a little time save. It saves about three frames in this area. Right when you gain control, what you can do while there's while you're, it's, it's fading out into a cutscene, you can perform a full combo and have that last hit of the combo break the box. And that basically just skips you doing a, a, a B attack. And because you can dash instead, it saves about three frames. It's a really small time save, but might as well. So wolf controls are a bit wonky. When you dash, Link has to turn before dashing. So like right there, I had to wait before dashing because he was face left. So if I dash as, as soon as possible, he would dash. He always dash directly forward. He never dashes at a, at, he can never do an instant turnaround. So you have to wait for him to turn before dashing uh, in certain places or else he'll just bonk the wall because he'll dash forwards when you need him to turn first. So, well, so for example, doing a 180 degree turn, so like right here I'm face kind of away from where I want to go, so I have to turn before dashing, or else I'll just bonk the wall. Just gotta wait just a tiny bit of time. It's mostly notable for 180 degree turns, because 
when you dash, Link has to completely turn around, so often he'll just do this weird wide circle instead of dashing directly in the direction you want. Another thing to notice is I'm doing- I'm making sure I'm refreshing my dash. I'm always keeping my dash. So right here I'm gonna do a dash cancel, which is pressing A then B very quickly. And what that does is it refreshes my dash so that I can dash instantly when I hit the ground. So, the way dashes work is that you have your dash speed for a certain amount of time. If you lose your dash by maybe hitting a wall or going off a ledge, you lose your dash, meaning you can't dash again for a, a set amount of time. Unless you canceled it by losing your dash very, very early. Oh, here I'm trying to jump off the ledge and hit, basically make that part fall down, but actually kind of, I went too far left, so I have to jump down again. It was to, it was to try to avoid this midnight text, but I kind of, uh, I, I kind of botched it, had to go all the way around again. So here you notice right there, I was actually able to jump uh, a lot quicker after that text. It's frame perfect. You can press A in a one frame window and it skips this animation of Minna kind of going towards the ledge before you can jump. I kind of just mash for it. I just mash the A button and hope that I get it on the correct frame. So we'll see another one coming up later. So there you can't do it. It's only after text boxes. So here there's one. So I'm going to try to mash A. So that's the animation. I did not get it that time, but that animation I was trying to skip of Minda going to the ledge before jumping. And here's there's another frame perfect skip. So there's supposed to be a Minda text there, but if I, you do a frame perfect uh, right after canceling, uh, right after canceling the cutscene by pressing st uh, the the the, pl the start button twice, you can then perform a frame perfect jump attack to skip a Minda text there. And here again, making sure I time my dashes correctly, that I always keep dashing. So I'm never losing my dash. If I dash, I uh, either A, do it very close to a ledge, or B, I do it so far from the ledge, but by the time I reach the ground, I can dash again. And if all else fails, if I do lose my dash, maybe I lose it for a split second, it's faster to B attack than running for a little bit, because B attack has faster speed. So if, if all else fails and I lose my dash, because it, I just have to, I B attack so that I don't have to walk for a bit. So these are just a bunch of things to make sure that I'm moving. I'm always moving as fast as possible as Wolf and not just kind of walking, waiting for my dash to refresh. And here, you notice I've been doing this a good bit, jump attacking into triggers. So there are triggers that they trigger mid-air but you lose your speed if you trigger them while on the ground, but you can move just a little bit of distance as the trigger happens by jump attacking into it. So I've done that a few places in the run, just wanted to point that out there. So now, now that we're here, we actually can't get the sword and shield. So this is where you're supposed to get the sword and shield. You may notice I have it on my back. First of all, it's slow to get it. Second, we can't even do it because because of the we put Ordon in the specific state from the back in time glitch, I actually cannot even get the sword and shield. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to do the skip for the sword and shield. And that's going to involve a trick called the long jump attack. So this is the first place you're going to see in the game. Long jump attack is a fast attack. It's a fast jump attack that you do off of enemies or anything you can target. So we're going to use this Bulbin. We're going to bring him over to the trigger. And then we're going to use him to jump attack over the Midna trigger that's supposed to prevent you from reaching Fair and Twilight early. So there you go. Very, very precise trick. Actually, that, that made it look easier than it is. It's because that was very fast. And I got very good RNG. So you want him to attack. You can't even do the jump until he attacks. So you want him to not attack. And then you need to push him into the correct position. Then he gets into the correct position. You jump attack him. And then at the correct time, you jump attack again. And that second jump attack is going to be a very high speed jump attack compared to the regular one. And that gives you enough speed to go over the ground trigger and then reach the the loading zone and skipping midna from uh from sending you back to ordon so now that allows us to enter fair and twilight and if that didn't work we literally could not do back in time because we literally can't get the sword and shield so this is the first shadow beast fight shadow beast can be kind of annoying you need to get the last two, or, or all three, grouped up. And sometimes they just don't really want to cooperate. Sometimes it's faster to kill one, and then two, and sometimes it's faster to do all three, it really depends. But you have to make sure that your Midna Charge 
defeats the last two. Or if you're a human, you want to make sure your spin attack defeats the last two at the same time. Or else the last one alive roars and then brings the others back to life. So here, we didn't even get the Elden Vessel. So the re- uh, not the Elden Vessel, the Farron Twilight Vessel. We're not even going to beat Farron Twilight. Nice bonk there. We're not going to beat Farron Twilight. Oh, here you're going to notice a frame perfect dash. There we go. So that- there's a one frame window where- so when you finish digging, Minna's supposed to then hop on Link's back. But there's a one frame window before Minna does that that you can input a dash. So I got it both times there. So we're just going through Fair, we're going through Fair and Twilight. So we're gonna end up escaping Fair and Twilight. So normally you'd have to beat Fair and Twilight, and then you have to go through the Purple Mist and get your lantern stolen by the monkey, and then go to the Forest Temple. We're not gonna do any of that. Uh, instead, so we're going to be uh, we're gonna get be going to Forest Temple without without even clearing Fair and Twilight. But first, we're gonna be getting the Master Sword very 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 early in the game. So. This is a really big sequence right? break. The Master Sword you're not supposed to get until way, way later in the game. You're not supposed to get it until after you've beaten Lakebed Temple, which is the third dungeon in the game. Instead, we're going to get it before entering a single dungeon. And that's with a super jump from a Midnight Charge. So if we push up against one of these Shadow Beasts and he does the correct attack, we can just barely land on the wall out of bounds here. So these Minna Charges, they have a lot of speed. And so you can get them angled upwards if you do them correctly. And there we go. So we actually got to this out-of-bounds area. And then we can jump over a gap and then reach the landing area and then enter the, the Sacred Grove really, really, really early in the game. And so you have to be wolf, so that's why it's kind of wonderful that this even works. It's kind of crazy because you can't howl at the statue unless you're wolf. You have to be wolf for this to even work. This was mega patched in HD. Uh, this is not possible to do in the HD remake version. This is the GameCube version, by the way. This is not the Wii version. The Wii version uh, is a different speedrun. Actually, the only difference between this and the Wii version is that the Wii version, you can't LJA. You can't do the long jump attack. There, I climbed really far left, and he actually kind of saw Wolf Link popped up in an instant. Uh, that's because if you grab kind of into a wall and you're Wolf Link, Link will just climb up instantly to kind of make it so that he doesn't climb into the wall. So that is faster than climbing normally because it skips the entire climbing animation. You're going to see a few of them throughout the run. So nothing special here, just running around as wolf. Gotta make sure the angles that I take are as tight as possible. You see me hugging walls as closely as possible, just to make sure I'm taking the shortest distance possible. Just little things to think about to save frames here and there. And then here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a really late B attack, aim to the left. So I'm trying to, I wanna make it so that this attack that I do on Skull Kid lands me on the ground because then I don't have to jump off the ledge. I'm already on the ground and I aim it left because that's towards the area where I want to go. And now you can see that as it turns out Skull Kid just does this magical disappearing act. He kind of, he doesn't run all the way. He kind of just goes behind the corner and disappears. But I reached him so fast that we got to see him disappear. So it's kind of funny you can do that. And here you're going to see an example of me losing my dash. I do this on purpose. So you saw there, there was a little, there was a little waiting time where I had to do the next dash. That's because I had not done a dash cancel, which is basically dashing off of a ledge or dashing and then B attacking. I dash, wait a little bit and then B attack. And then I still had to wait a little bit of time before I refresh my dash. But luckily it doesn't lose time there because I have to wait anyway. So I, I I'm kind of just taking a, a path here to make sure I always 
hit the skull kid at the same time right after he breathes. I have to wait anyway because he he'll he'll just teleport away if you if you uh, jump attack him too early. So that all that movement I did just around in the like an uh, kind of like a ellipse shape path was just to make sure that my timing was correct. Now this puzzle is considered one of the hardest puzzles in the game if you don't know the combination already, which I do. So luckily I just have the correct solution memorized and it's always the same and makes the puzzle pretty easy because it's literally always the same. Just for show, I like to, there's a two frame window after each jump, during, before each jump that you can input a sense. It doesn't do anything, it just looks cool. Try to get all of them. They're all two frames. Does not accomplish anything besides looking cool. Oh, I just failed one. Oops. Well. Oh, just failed another. Well. Alright, and now we have gotten the Master Sword at the 21 minute mark when normally it's supposed to take well over an hour to get this, so very early in the run. I'll go over in a second why we do this, but it is it is actually, it saves a lot of time throughout the run. I believe it's about 20 or so minutes that this sequence break saves. Not possible on the HD Remake version. The way they patch this sequence break on the HD Remake, which is on the Wii U, is they first of all they added a gigantic wall to the out of bounds area that you that prevents you from uh from going too far as soon as you get up top you're just blocked by this gigantic wall and secondly they changed the way the shadow beast attacks so that, that attack well, actually there's two different attacks you can do there's an over the head swing and a big big wide swing the big wide swing is the one that we want but they removed the big wide swing on, on that Shadow Beast so that he only does an over the head swing, which you cannot get to the out of bounds area. Though I believe I saw somebody in the Discord at one, one time say that they did get out of bounds with that jump. So I'm not, that might not 100% be true, but I at least know that it, the way that we do in the speedrun, we really want him to do the wide swing. I, it is definitely at least easier, but it, I, apparently the other way is possible too. So. But that, it's really that big wall, the be, that big gigantic wall that's preventing the HD version from ever getting to the Sacred Grove because it's just it's just too big and there's no way to get around it. Why do we get the Master Sword this early? What is, what is the purpose? So it actually serves a bunch of different purposes and each of them are you'll see all throughout the run, well throughout the beginning of the run. It's it's going to save a bit of time in different places. So for one, we're about to do it right now. This allows us to, this unlocks warping anywhere. So normally you can't really warp anywhere, uh, but now we can just pull, we can just call mid and warp instantly. So that's really useful for one. Uh, for two, we can now transform into human whenever we want. So that's gonna allow us to be human in Twilight. And that is going to be combined with a glitch we're going to see later, the long jump attack. That that big jump we saw as Wolf to enter Fair and Twilight, the Sword and Shield skip, we can do that as Human too, And that's really useful when you have the Boomerang, because the Boomerang lets you do it almost anywhere. So you don't need an enemy to do it, you just target the Boomerang, basically. So that's where we're going to go. We're going to head to Fair and Twilight. Fair, Fair and, sorry, not, well, we are in Fair and Twilight. We're going to head to the Forest Temple. And in the Forest Temple, we're gonna go get the Boomerang. So that's our goal right now, is to go get the Boomerang, and then we're gonna leave. So not actually gonna complete the Forest Temple. So this time, we're not gonna go around the the Purple Mist. We're gonna go straight through it. And this is gonna look kind of funny, because we're in Twilight. So when you, you, you can still use the Lantern to clear the mist. So here, I'm gonna, we're gonna become human in Twilight, which again, you cannot do. So we're gonna use the Lantern to go through. And it's gonna look really weird. You're not gonna see the fog actually clear, but it is clearing. It just visibly, you don't visually see it. So it looks kind of weird. It looks like we're going straight through. It looks like we should void out, but actually we're clearing it by those swings that we do. 
And back to the same area where we did Sword and Shield Skip. This time, we're going to actually defeat the Shadow Beast because that's required to get to the Forest Temple. This time, we're going to do this as human. You're not supposed to do this as human. You're supposed to do this as a wolf. Just got to make sure that my last spin attack defeats the last two in one hit. So, you remember that save that I made earlier, way, way earlier in the run? I made a save right after defeating Bo. Well, that's going to come in handy here, because that's used for the trick called Boss Flags. It's a really complicated trick, but it starts by performing the same back-in-time glitch that I performed at the very beginning of the run. So, it's we can void out in this next room, and then we can soft reset on the same frame. And trigger the uh, trigger the back in time glitch to gain control of Link on the title screen. We're gonna make sure we save first because uh, after I perform all this, I actually want to get I want to get back to here at Forest Temple. So I'm very important to save first. And once we're in back in time, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do this pretty complicated thing, which basically involves uh, jumping down and try and voiding out, and then uh, <laughs> there we go, and then uh, loading up that save file that uh was at bow but now for some reason some complicated reason we re we spawn in the king bulban fight and then what, what i did there was i started the fight so i entered the fight and then as i was entering the fight well as i soft reset i to uh to re go back to the title screen i entered the fight so basically the game thinks i'm in the king bulban fight so now i'm playing the game and the game thinks I'm in the fight. And so it's gonna think we're in the fight for a good bit. So what that does is it activates a glitch called the boss flags glitch, which you get in the King Bolin fight. And so that is going to allow me to have all of the monkeys freed. So that, that boss flags, it's just this interesting flag glitch that gives you all the monkeys. It does a few other things too, but that's what we're mainly gonna use it for because then we could swing across to the area where we get the boomerang and skip freeing all of the monkeys in the dungeon. Now this is really annoying. You're supposed to have the, the, the slingshot here to defeat these two spiders, but instead you can kind of throw nuts at them. The throws are really specific. That's why I stood in very specific spots, but you can skip throwing the second nut. The first one you can't skip. You need at least one of those spiders killed. Can't You can't get up there. You can kind of avoid the second one, but it's really annoying and it's really RNG dependent in which way the spider faces. If it's facing towards you, you can't go because then it'll attack you. And so now we're, we're going to go straight to Ook. And so you see now that I go through this loading zone, now you can see all those monkeys are tamed. That's because of the boss flags glitch that I had activated earlier at the start of the dungeon. Now all we're going to do is we're just going to simply swing across, but you're definitely not supposed to do this early. You're supposed to then backtrack and then free all the monkeys. But fortunately, they're all conveniently freed for us. So here's actually another example of how the Master Sword, the early Master Sword glitch saves a lot of time. This fight is supposed to be in two phases, but the Master Sword deals double the damage of the regular sword. So instead, it's going to be one phase. That's going to save a good bit of time. And we're going to see that later, too. Just the Master Sword dealing double damage, making fights faster. There I did a jump attack quick spin. So the... Uh, the quick spin deals double damage, so does the jump attack. And that quick spin double hit there, so I did a jump attack and then the quick spin hit twice. And then all I had to do was do a simple stab and that was enough damage. The jump attack's quick spin is performed by doing a jump attack, which is holding target and pressing A, and then spinning the stick midair. And then on landing, you don't even have to press B for it, Link will perform a grounded quick spin. You can also do a quick spin on the ground by just spinning the stick and pressing B. And you can spin either way, clockwise or counterclockwise, and that'll change what direction Link spins in the game. And that'll be useful for later, so just keep that in mind. So, the boomerang, this is the only place in the entire game the boomerang talks, so it's just kind of funny that it does. Now we're gonna save and quit. It's gonna take us back to the, the, uh, the start of the dungeon. When we save, we're just gonna soft reset and that 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 skips the the quitting out to the title screen so now that we have the boomerang we have everything we need from this dungeon we're not actually going to beat it so normally warping the bridge in the the elden twilight to get to kakariko which is where we want we want to go to kakariko that's one of the places where we want to go next there's a bridge that you need to warp from 
from Theron, from North Theron. And in order to warp that bridge, you have to beat the the Forest Temple. But uh, we are not beating the Forest Temple, so there must be another way, right? Well, there is. It's the power of the boomerang long jump attack. So with the boomerang, we can now do that same big jump as we did as Wolf. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the power of the early Master Sword to transform into human, and then we're going to use the boomerang to escape Fair and Twilight. So this is the same thing as Sword and Shield Skip, where there's this Midna trigger on the ground. It's very precise, very, very precise. But if you have the exact perfect position, you can just barely jump, at, you can long jump attack over this trigger that prevents you from escaping Farron. And then now we can get to Hyrule Field without having beaten the Forest Temple or having cleared Farron Twilight. So big sequence break there. And you're going to see it again later in the run because we're going to warp back. So we're going through Hyrule Field. We're going to take a right. We're going to go towards the Elden Twilight first. That's the first place we're going. And so there's supposed to be this mailman trigger where he goes, hey, and then he runs up to you and gives you mail. Well, we can skip that trigger by, again, doing a long jump attack over it. So, just the gist of how a long jump attack works as boomerang, with with the boomerang, if the boomerang's out of bounds, which you saw there, it was out of bounds, then, uh, or if it's over a ground that is higher than the ground that Link is standing on, it will make Link do a faster jump, much, much faster jump than a regular jump attack. And you don't want to press target. Actually, you automatically target the boomerang. So, if you, if you press target, you press the L button, then that actually breaks the target from the boomerang, and then the trick doesn't work. So you, you actually just pull sword and press A. You don't even hold target at any point to get the trick to work. It's actually pretty simple to do. Just make sure the boomerang is out of bounds, or it is over ground that is higher than the ground that Link is standing on. So now we're headed to Elden Twilight. First place is the gorge. So this gorge, this is where you're supposed to warp the bridge. Well, we're not going to warp the bridge, because that requires beating Forest Temple, and as I mentioned, we're not beating the Forest Temple, so instead, we're going to jump- we're going to do another LJA long jump attack over it. But first, so when you first trigger this cutscene, it's supposed to force warp you away so that you warp the bridge. Well, we don't want that. We want to go straight to Kakariko, so instead, I'm, what I'm going to do is there's a one-frame window right there. There's a one-frame window where you can perform a jump attack to uh in the middle in between the two cutscenes so that you void out and respawn in the area which prevents you from from warping away that's important because while we're here we want to go to kakariko village failing that one frame trick loses a minute because then we have to come all the way back here and then finally go to kakariko village so here we're going to skip the gorge the first part is called rupee roll we're going to take this rupee and put it on top of this fence and then that way, when we, we're going to LJA onto, t onto the top of it, that basically gives us rupee text that happens the first time you get the rupee. And then we can perform a roll because otherwise we just slide back in bounds. And that roll puts us on the other side of the fence. So now, when we're in the correct position, we can uh, LJA all the way across. And now we've effectively skipped the gorge, which skips warping the bridge. So then we can head straight to Kakariko Village and uh, and skip that entire thing. Right here, I'm panning the camera up. I'll see me do that a bunch of places in Twilights because uh, there's a lot of lag, and that's just a lag reduction strat, is panning the camera up. Now, here, you have to be careful to go around this trigger. There, There's a trigger there that causes you to fight King Bulblin, but uh, I need to make sure I go around it. I'm going to go around it twice, actually, on the way here, and then I'm going to be going on the way back. Uh, I don't want to trigger that fight, so I go in a weird path there, around it. So this is going to look kind of weird. I am going to get to Kakariko, which is where you get the Elden Vessel. But then I'm after I beat these Shadow Beasts, I'm going to make this warp, and then I'm actually going to just go back. Go back to the Gorge. Now, why is this important? Why do I need to go back to the Gorge? So... Uh, as I mentioned, the gorge, when you trigger the cutscene, it warps you away. Well, that not only does it warp you away, but it also triggers something called map warping, which is basically pulling up the map and then and then uh, triggering the warps and warping, which is different from calling Midna, because when you're warping from pulling up the map instead of calling Midna, this is necessary way, way, way later in the run in order to warp the cannon. So we have to activate this. In order to warp the cannon, which the, the cannon is required to enter City in the Sky, we have to 
activate this trigger. And now we're now that we're ready, now that we've done everything that we want to do, we've gone to Kakariko, we've activated the warp, now we can do the forced warp away after this cutscene. So now this is a forced warp. We have to warp away. We're going to go back to Farron. We're gonna go to South Farron. And then we're gonna perform Farron Escape again. And then we're gonna go to Lanayru. And perform more sequence breaks. So again, this is basically deja vu. Same thing. Gonna do uh, forest escape once again by LJing over the trigger using the boomerang. Another thing to mention that you may notice: this is true for all first-person items, not just the boomerang. So, well, really in this run, uh, actually, I think it's just boomerang and claw shot. I don't think it's all first-person items. But what I'm doing is I'm pressing C up before pulling the boomerang. So you just saw it there. You heard the C me entering C up. That's faster than just pulling the boomerang regularly. That saves a good bit of time. You're going to see that with Claw Shot as well. If there's another way you can uh, you could enter faster, and I'll mention that later, but that's basically about holding target. Now, you're going to see that later in the run. You can hold target and then press the item, and that also works as well. Faster than just pulling the item. You hold target, pull the item, and then let go of target. So again, uh, now we're headed to the left. We're headed towards Lenayru. And, uh, again, panning the camera up to reduce lag. And so, Lanayru has this big fence in the way. So, uh, we're gonna do a sequence break to get to Lanayru. Uh, basically what we're gonna do is we're going to, uh, bonk the, the gate. And then side hop, and it's RNG whether you, whether you make it through. So you got, sometimes it takes a few times, but eventually it works. Just like the, the gate at the start of the run, you can go right through it. And then now we're actually accessing, accessing this area from the backside. You're not supposed to access it from here. And then also don't mind the sky. It's green. Don't worry about it. It's okay. <laughs> the sky is just green. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so now we're in Lanayru. So we're also here as human. So keep in mind... As human, we can sink down. That's something that's very, very important. Because uh, we're going to perform a big, big sequence break to le reach Lake Bed Temple early. So Lake Bed Temple is under Lake Hylia. And so to get there, you're supposed to uh, get the Zora Armor and the Water Bombs and bomb the entrance. But what we can do instead is we have just barely enough air, and it only works in Twilight, to sink all the way down, and then we can clip out of bounds on this pillar and have just frames of air enough. This is a very precise trick, by the way. And so we can clip out of bounds right where the pillar meets the wall, and then we can get to the loading zone. Now, I'm pulling, putting on iron boots and putting it away. As you see, I'm taking it on, taking it off. What that does is it allows me to move while swimming down. That's why I iron boots pump, so I can move diagonally down instead of directly down or just directly sideways. That's useful for, uh, for swimming in directions that are not just directly down. So there, I was able to swim down as I was moving forward by pumping the iron boots. So now, when we save and quit, this is only because I have the Master Sword. This allows me to skip swimming from the start to here. And that's important because I don't have the... I don't have the... Uh, the Zor Armor. The Zor Armor is the only way to swim from there to here. So if... And that, because we have the Master Sword, we can skip the Zora Armor. Otherwise, that save warp would not have taken me there. That's why, and another very important thing about early Master Sword is that it allows you to reach Lake Bed early and skip the Zora Armor. So we're never going to be getting the Zora's Tunic, which makes you swim a lot faster and, most importantly, gives you infinite air. You can see a bunch of LJAs here to skip uh, bombing stalactites, a bunch of things. We're supposed to have water bombs here, but we just completely skip them. And as I mentioned, we're here really early. This is a really big sequence break, and it only works in... That that pillar clip only works during Twilight, because when you've completed an linear Twilight, then the water is higher, and then you don't have enough air to reach the bottom, unless you have Zora armor. Nice bonk, by the way. So, we don't, uh, we don't have everything we need to beat this dungeon. So, I'm actually going to be getting Uku, which is basically a shortcut that opens up that allows you to enter and exit a dungeon. So this this cute little chicken, I, I don't know if you call him cute, but basically he allows you to warp out of the dungeon. And then you can call him to warp back in. That's going to be very important. So why why can I not beat this dungeon yet? That's because Morphiel, the boss of the dungeon, uh, 
you're supposed to have Zor armor. For one, I don't have it. But the fight is so long that you cannot do it in one air gauge. You need it to refill your air. And so that requires something called the water bomb, which is uh, a bomb that you can pull underwater. There's a glitch with the water bomb that refills your air. So we have to get water bombs. But I don't have a bomb bag. And I can't get a bomb bag until later. So until I've gotten water bombs, I cannot be this dungeon. So I'm going to have to uh, come back. But, but good thing that we opened the shortcut. We can come back later. More LJAs to go faster. And so now we're going to go to the claw shot. Now, we're going to take a... We're going to do something really interesting. This is another property of boss flags, which we got earlier at the forest temple. Boss flags makes it so that you can trigger this boss fight from just taking the exit. We're going to take the exit into the room and just look up. And that allows us to trigger the fight from the exit going backwards. It's really funny. That's where you're supposed to leave instead of enter. And another example of where uh, the Master Sword, the Master Sword comes in handy here. We can do a one cycle on this tongue, so it deals double damage for one. So instead, this would have to be two cycles. And the way to one cycle is you have to hit the tongue fast enough that you connect all ten hits. So you gotta make sure each of those ten hits are as close to each other as possible within a pretty precise amount of time. And that allows you to get in all ten hits before the... The toad says it's done. It's time to go back up again. Instead, we can just one cycle. So now I can get the claw shot and we can get out of here. So once again, gonna save and quit. Gonna to save and soft reset while uh, saving to get back to the beginning of the dungeon. And then we're gonna leave with Uku and come back a bit later in the run. Not ready to beat the dungeon yet, but we will later. Because beating this dungeon is mandatory. So we're gonna uku out, and then we'll uku back in later for the water bombs. But we need a bomb bag first, so. No bomb bag, no completed dungeon. So, we're gonna go back out to the Linear Twilight. We do have to beat the Linear Twilight. You have to beat Elden Twilight. The only Twilight that we can skip completing is, is Farron Twilight, but those two we do have to complete. So. The first step to beating Lanary Twilight is that you have to thaw Zora's Domain, which means that because you need the Meteor from beating Elden Twilight, you have to complete Elden Twilight first before beating Lanary Twilight. So what we're going to do is we're going to head up to Zora's Domain. That requires taming the Kargarok uh, by beating the Rider. Now, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to knock off the Rider by, uh, by biting the bird a bunch of times, and then he'll fall off and then kill the Rider. But... There's a, a faster way you can do this. It only works with the early Master Sword because that allows us to be human. And human can go underwater. Wolf cannot go underwater. So what we can do is we can lure the Kargarok Rider to the water and then go underwater and then make him come for us while we're underwater. And then if when the Rider is under the water, that actually immediately kills the, the Rider because Riders cannot live while underwater. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna wait for him, lure him under the water, and then kind of like walk underneath the water and get it to drown the rider. And that defeats the rider, it saves a few seconds. That does look like a very fast kill, but the reason it doesn't save, you know, 20 or so seconds is because we have to, or, or 15 or so seconds, is because we have to transform twice. So you just saw, I had to transform into wolf. You have to transform or else the camera gets really wonky here. And we have to transform anyway, because we wanna be, we wanna be wolf later. So two transforms makes it not save as much time as it otherwise would. Here's a clip we can do out of bounds. So we can kind of squeeze between those two walls and, and and fly upwards and diagonally left. And that allows me to get out of bounds. Now, why is that useful? Because you may see, if you look at the map in the bottom left, you see that there's a twist. There's a bend where you go right and then left inbounds. Well, instead, we can kind of just skip that bend by going directly out of bounds, and that allows us to take a bit, a direct, more of a direct path. It saves a few seconds than going inbounds. It also looks a lot cooler, so style points are important too, right? We want to make sure we take as direct of a path as possible because the shortest point between the shortest path between two points is a straight line right 
Here, there's a frame perfect jump attack we can do that we did earlier to skip text. Did not get it, unfortunately. But that was something I was trying to do, was press the A button frame perfectly to jump attack to skip that text. And now, unfortunately, we're coming up on the biggest time loss in the run. This is actually really comical, so... Uh, <laughs> this is about to be really funny. So we want to climb up to Zora's domain. So it's frozen, unfortunately, so until we thaw it later. We're gonna have to climb up these icicles. Well, one thing to note is that there's gonna be these stalactites that fall, and you want to jump. You want to wait for them to fall before jumping. So, but me, I'm trying to jump as early as possible, so I don't want to wait too long. The first one, wait, we're good. Second one, gotta wait and jump too early. <laughs> I remind you guys that this is still the world record. I, I promise you this is the world record, but pretty silly mistake. It gets worse. So, we'll make our way back up again. Try number two. Well, now I gotta count correctly. The route might have jumps. And I miscounted. <laughs> and then, I guess here I didn't really know where to go. I don't even know where to back this up. So I was like, wait, can I go there? Oh, no, can't go there. All right, let's just jump all the way back down. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is, like, comical. <laughs> but, um... It is still the world record. Um, but yeah, that was a, a minute time loss right there, unfortunately. That was the biggest mistake in the entire run. I think it just makes it even more sweet, the fact that the world record has, like, a big mistake in it, so that it's not just some kind of crazy perfect run. I mean, it still has definitely room for optimization, as you saw there. So anyway, finally heading our way to Zoro's Domain. Now we're going to defeat the Shadow Beast, and we're going to trigger the warp. Now this is an annoying fight because uh, it has a divider, so we just want to be very careful that our our any of our that minute charge that those last two Shadow Beasts, we don't want it to hit the divider because if the divider interrupts your attack, which is it's meant to do, it's meant to so that you accidentally bonk the divider, that makes it so you can't attack the second guy, and then he roars and then brings all them back to life. Just gotta be really careful with that to make sure that it doesn't happen. There's gonna be a few others in the run that are like that. So now that we have triggered that warp, we're gonna warp back there later. So we triggered the warp for Zora's Domain, and then we're gonna warp back there after. But first, we're gonna beat the Elden Twilight, because we need it for the meteorite in order to trigger the the waterfall, the, the, the frozen Zora's Domain, which gonna, allows us to beat the Linear Twilight. That's why we have to Ellen Twilight first. So we warp back to Kakariko, and now we're going to complete the Elden Twilight. So we get the Elden Vessel, and we're going to complete the the Twilight. So a good Elden Vessel is a 46. The best is 45. Mine was a 47, so not too great, but uh, stay tuned. Okay, so a cool sequence break you can do here. You're supposed to go to the Sanctuary, then watch a big cutscene, and then go into the basement. Well, we can enter from the backside again because of the early master sequence break we can clip in from the graveyard into this area you're supposed to exit but instead we can enter through there as human and then uh we're also going to uh now we're going to finally exit the correct way so we entered from the exit now we're going to actually exit through the exit and then we're going to trigger a cutscene that's supposed to have triggered when you exit for the first time and now we'll collect that tier from earlier. The way tiers work is they actually take a, a while to form, and then they usually form high in the air, so you have to jump attack them, uh, because otherwise you'd have to wait for them to come down. Uh, it means that there's a lot of downtime. After, after defeating a bug, uh, there's a lot of downtime before you jump attack the, the tier. So often we're going to be getting rupees. Now why do I need rupees? Later on, we have to pay 300 rupees to to fire in order to warp the cannon, in order to repair the cannon to get to City in the Sky. That's going to cost 300 rupees, so I'm going to make sure to get as many rupees as possible until then. So a lot of the times, we're waiting for tiers to spawn and, and be fully formed, and in that time, we can get rupees. So here's the Elden Hotel. Another comical mistake here. I wanted to light the thing on fire, but then I grabbed the wrong one. There we go. All right, light the fireplace. There we go. And that makes the bug come out. So 
Here's another place where we're waiting for this tier to spawn. So what we can do, there was a rupee tech skip. So something that's kind of awkward is that after you save warp, all rupee techs refreshes. So uh, blues and yellows and reds, blues, yellows, reds, orange, everything that it's not a green has a rupee text and it respawns after every save and quit. So, I, and this is something that was fixed in HD, but in the GameCube version, we have to worry about rupee text. And it's slow because, you know, you get rupee text. You don't want to, you know, watch the, that, you know, quick showing off the rupee. So what we want to do is we want to be airborne while picking up the rupee for long enough. So that's why I do that side hop over the rupee to skip the, the text. They're going to see that later on. There's a trick coming up that's, uh, it's, uh, a way you can skip the entire, well, the entire in interior of the bomb house. So, there's this big house that you're supposed to enter, and then you're supposed to explode the house, and then that will defeat the three bugs to get the three tiers. Well, instead, what we can do, uh, if this is in this X area, we can, we can defeat the bug as it's going into the house. So, we can do this jump. So the, the, the bug is supposed to trigger when you reach a certain area, but we can do this pretty precise jump here to to go around that trigger for the bug to spawn. And then we get really close before triggering the bug. So we're going to do this really precise jump here to get past around that trigger. And then now we trigger the bug and we actually min to charge it before it even enters the house. And so that bug de de being defeated is the trigger for the house disappearing so it just like magically disappears after the bug has finally exploded I mean defeated so it looks kind of weird and that skips going in the interior of the house saving about 40 seconds there's gonna be another example of a rupee tech skip here I'm gonna back hop over this blue rupee. There we go, skip the text. Otherwise, if I had triggered that on the ground, uh, that would have triggered the text. Also, you gotta make sure when you when you side hop or back hop, you're close enough to the rupee, because you have to be airborne for a certain amount of time when collecting the rupee before reaching the ground. Otherwise, it doesn't work. All right, now we're heading to the Death Mountain Trail and finishing up Ellen Twilight. There's going to be a quick climb here, so we're going to climb kind of to the left. And you saw Link just pop up instantly to skip the climbing animation. And then there's a Shadow Beast fight, so this is where we're going to be activating a warp. We're going to be coming back here after we're done with Elden Twilight to get the Meteor, and then that is going to thaw the Zora's Domain. Now here's an example. All right, luckily that reached, but you saw that kind of other Shadow Beast. They were really spread out there, so they can kind of do that where they get really spread out, and then hopefully the Minion Charge reaches the second guy. Otherwise, if it hadn't worked, he would have roared and all four would have respawned. It really just shows, you saw how long I had to wait for that tier to form. It really does take a while. It takes a few seconds for you to be able to collect the tier. Alright, so one more. And there we go, that is the Elden Twilight. So now that we've completed, then we're going to warp back to the area in Death Mountain Trail and then trail and then get the meteor. And then that we will warp to Zora's domain and thaw Zora's domain.
Whenever you transform in some areas, you gotta make sure you're not visible. So there, we went behind that wall before transforming. Now, we're gonna be human. We're gonna, we're, we're gonna use the power of the early masters again to transform. And that's important because when we reach Lanayru, there's a cutscene that you're supposed to watch. It's the Rutella cutscene. You can actually skip that cutscene. So that Rutella cutscene is triggered on the ground. You're supposed to be wolf, and then you're supposed to exit on top or on, uh, on the ground. But we can instead, we can, uh, we can exit under the water. And that's, that makes the, the cutscene not trigger. So that's another very big benefit. So here we go under, and we don't trigger the Rutella cutscene. The big benefit of being human, because then you can go underwater. There is a way to skip that trigger as wolf. It's not really viable for humans. It's really only something you see in TAS speedruns. But it is possible. So that's what that would do, because that would skip two transforms if you if you could do that. We're gonna have to transform back again into wolf. And then now we can go get the linear vessel. And then we will complete the Lanayru Twilight, which is the longest twilight. And this twilight is gigantic because you have to go all the way to the castle town. That's why it's a really long twilight. It's a very big map to cover. So longest twilight. So, another Shadow Beast fight. This is another kind of difficult one, because the last two that you defeat tend to be really spread out. So you kind of see, I kind of I kind of just draw the other one over to the right area. You have to be in his line of sight, but you don't want to be too close to him, because if you go too close to him, then as soon as he reaches you, he doesn't go close enough, and then you, don't, and then you can't attack both of them, because they need to be close enough together for you to reach the second one. Again, getting rupees because we want to get to 300. Now we're going to warp back to Zora's Domain. There's a lot of warps back to Zora's Domain. There's quite a few left. I think there's this one and then there's two left after this. Now we're going to get the wall bug. There's a manip we're doing for this wall bug. We want to make it so that the the tier goes towards the edge right there so you saw the tier uh, not the tier the bug when it gets defeated it goes towards the edge now the tier is really close to where we want to go again we're going to go underneath the the platform so that we skip the rutella trigger well by swimming and then there's a pretty precise side hop you can do it's a three frame window there's a side hop you can do with this setup there we go and just barely reach that ledge there very barely and what that allows us to do is it lets us reach the waterfall bug so this bug is tucked in within the alcove of the waterfall now this is it's faster to do that than putting on boots and then going to the right side and then going up by a good bit by a, a decent few seconds but it adds in this pretty precise side hop but it does look cool, and style points matter. So here's a lily pad bug. They can kind of... It's its RNG how these bugs behave. A lot of the bugs, it's RNG how they behave. So like, there, that bug dodged me. It's kind of not really my fault. They can line up, or you double hit them with the same first attack. And I've gotten that, and it's very fast. But it's, again, RNG. It's just random whether it works or not. As we're heading down the river, we're getting closer and closer to going to Castle Town. We're gonna have to run all the way across Hyrule Field. It's gonna take a good bit of time to get there. We're gonna visit our pal Iza. We're gonna remember her. We're gonna come back later when it's when she's in her human form, not in her Twilight form, and we're gonna get we're gonna get the bomb bag from her. 
It's going to be very important because that's what's required to enter. That's what's required to, to get water bombs to beat Morphield. So, I'm going to come back later. Alright, and again, the camera is panned up to reduce lag all the way across the field. Now, the reason we have to go to Castletown is that there's a bug there. So, they put a bug all the way in Castletown. But, conveniently, it also, we trigger a warp along the way. And that warp will be used later in the run. We use a lot of the warps. A lot of, a lot of, actually, I think pretty much almost all of them we basically use it come back to these places a few times, so. Lots of warping in this run. This is also a notorious Shadow Beast fight because there's this big median in the middle and it's, it's it's set up exactly perfectly so that you bonk the median. There's a specific way that you can manip the Shadow Beast to make sure that doesn't happen. You also make sure you, you have to make sure you target them in the correct order. So I'm going to make sure when I do the B attack, I, char I target the one on the right and then on the left. It was really fast. So it was kind of hard to see it, but that makes sure. So when you target the Shadow Beast, you when you attack them, you attack them in reverse order of them being targeted. So and for example, I targeted the one on the right first, then the one on the left. Now, in reverse order, I'll attack the one on the left and then the one on the right. That's important because that median is on the right. So if I attack the one on the right first, I bonk the median and then not be able to hit the one on the left. So instead, I target the right then left. That way, I attack the left one and then the right and then bonk the median after I'm done with my attacks. But that's fine because they're both dead. Otherwise, the median bonking it would interrupt my attack and then the last one would be left alive and it roar and then they come back to life but here in castletown our dash speed is a bit slower we lose it after a good bit of time so what i'm doing is i'm pressing a then b a then b and i'm doing it's called a dash cancel and that that is the fastest way to move throughout castletown because just dashing you lose your dash speed really quickly after a good bit of time but so all we want to do is we want to get that startup dash speed when we have our max speed and then B attack to cancel it and then just do that over and over and over again. Because yeah, after you start a dash in Castletown, you go down to a lot slower speed. You start at a good bit of speed and then you slow down. That's one of the very few areas where that happens in the game. So it's a very rare thing that it's that was the case there and it was also the case in Elden Hotel way way earlier in the run but everybody everywhere else that's not true so that's like really the only place you're gonna see that kind of a b a b a b dash canceling but keep in mind I, I actually didn't really mention this Link's dash speed as wolf is different in different areas of the game so I uh, in larger areas, such as Hyrule Field, Link has the fastest da dash speed. So, the act for the actual number, he has 44 or 45, not sure, dash speed as Wolf. While Human is 32 for rolling. You can see Wolf Link moves quite a bit faster. But then in dungeons, Wolf Link dash speed is 33. While Human roll speed is 32, so it's still a bit faster, but as you can see, that real huge difference is really in those giant areas, the really, really large areas. So that's why in Hyrule Field, you always see me transform into Wolf and then transform back into Human after traversing the entire distance because you really do move a lot faster as Wolf. And it's, it's worth it, even though you have to do tra two transforms because of just how much faster Wolf Link moves. But in dungeons, that's not really the case. Wolf Link really does not move that much faster than Human Link in dungeons. It's a very slight difference, but it's still a little faster. So there we deliberately bonked so that we can get back down to the Lake Hylia, defeat the second last bug, and then we can activate the boss bug. So this is the final boss. This is the final bug. Really big bug. 
there's a specific strat for this fight actually kind of interesting so you're on this middle platform and then what the bug does is it, it attacks you and then it kind of swims away and then swims in a circle around the center platform so we latch on it we uh we do a bunch of bites and then it swims around so the way this works is that it will swim around for a set amount of time at least but it's actually kind of rng it's a random amount of time and it won't attack until it's on screen uh, it has to be on screen for it to like if it's not if you keep it off screen it will never attack it has to be on screen to attack and there what you want to do is you want to back up twice I actually kind of failed there but you want to you want to back up twice and then hit it as it's charging you and that will cancel its attack and then you can latch on so actually that first time i kind of messed up but um kind of got a bad water cycle but I go all the way to the edge of the platform so that those two back hops keep me on the platform. Otherwise, I don't want to go into the water. I need to back up a bit so that, that I can hit it for that jump attack. I go, and then I can latch on again. There we go. So that's what I was trying to do the first time. And then here at the very, very end, when I jump on the bug, I'm going to deliberately bonk one of the legs. So you kind of saw it there. I, 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 it, it ended the fight instantly. So normally Link's supposed to jump and hit all of the legs. But if you bonk it, it cancels it immediately because I guess it thought, hey, we're done. The animation's done. The bug's dead. So saves a bit of time. And there you go. That's the last Twilight. But yeah, uh, just to reiterate, during that fight, the reason I was going to certain parts of the platform is going to the very edge and then keeping the camera face in a certain direction. I wanted the bug to attack me from that direction. So that's why I make sure the camera is pointing in the correct direction. That way, uh, I'm at the I'm facing the right way so that the back hops put me towards the towards the middle of the the platform. So the camera angle does matter a lot for that fight. So just, just manipulating the bug, manipulating the bug to attack from the correct direction. Alright, so now we are going back down the uh back from Zora's domain down the uh down the river. And now we're gonna go gonna go to Upper Zora's River, which is where Iza lives. So Iza is very really important. Iza is going to give us a bomb bag. So, as I mentioned before, bombs are important because I need to get a bomb bag to carry water bombs in order to defeat Morphil, because water bombs are going to refill my air, so I don't need the Zora armor. So we're not getting the Zora armor at all this run. We're completely skipping the Zora armor. So, about this bomb bag. So there's there's two different bomb bags we're gonna get in the run, and one of them we're gonna keep, and the other one we're gonna lose. So, uh, more on that later first of all i uh, just want to mention we're going to be activating a golden wolf uh the golden wolf that we are nor you normally activate is in Farron, uh, right basically right outside of the forest temple but we're not going to be going there instead what we're going to be doing is we're going to be activating a different one outside of the castle town so this is going to be useful uh later a good bit later in the run because we need to get ending blow so that the wolf uh it when you activate it, you uh, you learn a hit a, a bunch of different hidden skills. The first one, Ending Blow, is the only one you really need to beat the game, because you need to act to trigger, you need it actually. If you don't have it, you can't defeat Gendorf. You can't perform the Ending Blow on Gendorf to to beat the game. So you need that one hidden skill, but none of the rest. You at least need that one. So we're gonna howl, and then that's going to activate the Hidden Wolf. It shows us where it is, right outside the Castle Town. So now. Now it's time to start getting some bomb bags. As I mentioned, there's going to be two bomb bags that we're going to get. The first one we're going to get from Iza. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to help Iza out by defeating these Shadow Beasts. So Iza's going to flip out and we're going to beat the Shadow Beasts. Then when we do, Iza is going to invite us out back. And she's going to say thank you for helping me and give you a bomb bag. And so that bomb bag, uh, we can steal it. So what we can do is we can warp out. There's a special way you can warp out from Iza. Uh, you could either use Uku, or there's a frame-perfect way that you can pull up the map on the same frame as talking to Iza, and that'll allow you to warp away. So either use Uku or warp away. We're going to warp away, because that allows us to go to Upper Zora's Domain. And so we're stealing this bomb bag. So this glitch, this is a glitch way to get the bomb bag. This bomb bag will only stay as long as we have not saved and quit, which we do have to save and quit later, so we're going to lose this bomb bag. What's useful about it is that it gives us regular bombs, 
And if we empty them, we can then warp, we can uku to lake bed and get and fill it with water bombs. Now, this, there's a Goron trapped under, in a boulder underneath the Zora's domain. And you're supposed to use a water bomb because water bombs are, you can't, you can pull water bombs in underwater, but not regular bombs. But there's this trick where we can actually use regular bombs to free the Goron. So what are we going to do? You saw there, actually, God, this is called Norvor. It's a frame perfect trick where you have to side hop and pull a bomb, the frame that you hit the water. And what that does is it allows you to pull a regular bomb underwater because you're otherwise not supposed to be able to do that. You're supposed to sink all the way down and then use a water bomb. We can do that to use a regular bomb, which skips me emptying my entire one bomb bag because you have to empty the bomb bag first before you can fill it with water bombs. And that allows me to use the default bombs and now I talk to the Goron, he gives me my second bomb bag. That's a permanent bomb bag. So the one that I got from Iza, that was temporary. That does, that's not going to exist after we save and quit. Or die. We're not going to die. Don't worry. And now I talk to the Goron, that gives me a permanent bomb bag, which uh, it's supposed to require you to have a previous bomb bag with water bombs. I use regular bombs to skip having to empty my bomb bag and use a water bomb on it. And now, this is the bomb bag I'm gonna have for the rest of the run. This is the one that I'm gonna keep. So this is the one I'm gonna empty it completely and then I'm gonna put water bombs in it. It's really cool, really cool movement there you can do. But I'm, I'm making sure I'm emptying the bomb bag as I move, because I don't wanna just be in place and empty the bomb bag. I wanna do it as I'm moving throughout areas. This glitch right here, what I just did is I frame perfectly press the button to call Midna and the button to open up the map. Then I call, then what happens is I open up the map and warp, and then that Midna call will interrupt the warp. So now I'm in the, I'm the, in the state, the property of warping away in this area. So when you are warping away, you're not supposed to be able to have control of Link while you're warping away. So we have control of Link and we're making sure that he doesn't warp. That disables all fade outs and all loading zones. So now there's, you're supposed to have the reek fish sent in order to get through this area. Otherwise, you get a bunch. You you just you know you you void out. This allows us to get to Snow Peak early. So this is the early Snow Peak with a, the glitch is called Map Glitch to deactivate loading zones and fade outs. And so uh, that's going to be seen once later in the run. But that's going to be used to get to Snow Peak early. See a bunch of quick climbs there to climb faster. So this is going to be taking us to the next dungeon. We're not supposed to get here this early. This is the Snow Peaks. We're getting to Snow Peak early in the run. We want Ball and Chain. That's why we're going to Snow Peak. You cannot beat the game without Ball and Chain. Why? There's a single phase in the Zant fight that you have to have Ball and Chain for. Otherwise, you literally cannot beat Zant. So the entire this entire sequence, going all the way up to Snow Peak, all the way through to Ball and Chain, is all just to get the Ball and Chain, and then we can leave. So here I have to howl at the songstone. That's to deactivate the map glitch. I need to deactivate it because then I need to go through a loading zone. So once I deactivate map glitch, this gets rid of it. Then I can go through the next loading zone and get to the next area. Otherwise, uh, we would just soft walk. We can't activate loading zones. Basically, this digging right here, if I had at map glitch still activated, he would just dig and then disappear and then that would be it. Game over. <laughs> but now that we have it deactivated, we can finally activate the loading zone. And we don't soft walk. Yay! Again, you're going to see uh, me emptying the bomb bag as I go. So what I'm doing is I'm pulling the bomb, then pressing B, then pressing A to roll. Now that allows me to, uh, basically, I'm moving while dropping bombs. You're also going to see me pulling bombs midair. Again, you want to be moving while you're pulling bombs. You don't want to just be dropping them in place. Because if I were to just stand in place and drop all of my 30 bombs without doing anything, it would it would lose a good bit of time. Lose about a minute to do that. But being but moving and doing actions while pulling bombs does not lose any time at all. There what you saw me do was I did an LJA and I reached the trigger to this area to to spawn and talk to this guy. And then I triggered it right before voiding out. And that skips fighting the Shadow Beast, because I actually don't need to activate this warp at all. What that's uh, unfortunate about that is that, yes, you do skip the Shadow Beast fight by doing that LJA, but also it means the fog doesn't clear. So the fog is not supposed to clear until you have beaten the Shadow Beast. But this fog, it's really annoying. We have to do the snowboarding with this really annoying fog in the way. So literally zero visibility. It's supposed to have cleared. Actually, fun fact, in the HD version, they do the same trick, but there's more visibility in the HD version, even with the fog. 
The fog is not as thick in the HD version of this game. When I'm snowboarding, I'm making sure to stay airborne as much as possible. And the spin attack keeps me airborne for even more time. When you spin attack, it cancels your uh, a little bit of your falling speed. Uh, and keeps you airborne for just a little bit longer. So that's why I'm doing a bunch of spin attacks. Because I, I stay I stay airborne for longer. So you have more speed when you're airborne. It saves a few frames uh, at a time. And throughout this whole area, I believe the save is just a few seconds. We're taking the shortcut here. So this is a faster way to go. This go up on that left side. And uh, really just like how do I do all this while blind? I'm really just looking at visual cues in the background. On the top... Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but there's some mountain peaks. There's like the mountain range. I actually aim at that so that I can do this while blind. Otherwise, I really don't know how I'd do this. I don't just have perfect memory. And then there's a... At the end, there's a midna trigger that tells you about the dungeon, but we can kind of go around it. I kind of mess up here. I almost got it. I want to do another jump attack to get past, but you kind of saw that trigger. I was trying to go around it, and I was trying to jump attack over it in two different areas. Kind of precise. Only saves about a second. So now we have entered Snow Peak. This is going to be really fast paced. This dungeon, we are, we blow right through it. There's a lot of skips. So for one, because of the LJA, we can do a big skip here. So we can go directly to this area right here and then jump across this gap to get to this part of the dungeon really early. And then it's going to look kind of weird, like we're clipping to the floor. We're actually just claw shotting, but you can claw shot through the floor here. Uh, that floor is never supposed to be there while you are down there. It's supposed to have broken the floor with the cannon. And then now we're going to do a, a really cool jump here just to skip claw shotting. It saves a little bit of time, making sure to drop bombs as we go. And then there's this clip we can do right here. This skips uh, getting a small key. So we're not going to get small key at all. We're just going to do an ice clip. Uh, I kind of failed here, but basically the idea is that Link's collision as Wolf his position is his back hind leg. So if you get his hind legs clipped into the ice, then when you transform, you stand up as human, and then human is clipped into the ice. Because Link's, when you transform to human, he stands up and he ends up being where Link's hind legs were. So since his hind legs were clipped into the ice as wolf, that allows you to clip through it. And then now we have gotten to this area. Now we're going to get to the ball and chain. So we're going to clip past this freeze arm. What we're going to do is we're going to get in vulnerability by getting hit on purpose. And then we're at a pretty precise angle. We're going to squeeze it and in this opening. There's a B attack we can kind of just jump through. And then we can actually open the door from, from behind it. It's kind of cool we can do that. Still allows you to do that. And it allows you to skip that freeze arm. Now we're going to fight the, the dark hammer. Uh, gonna use bomb sword advantage. Need to drop them anyway, but that bomb we can actually use it to damage the dark hammer. So kind of just serving dual purpose. We're wasting it because we need water bombs. So we, we really want it. We want to get rid of all the bombs in our bomb bag because otherwise we can't get bomb bag. We can't get water bombs. Water bombs are required to beat more field. Water bombs are what you can't pull normal bombs underwater. You can only pull water bombs underwater. Um, and the water bombs will be used to refill our air so that we can fight underwater bosses. It's not just for Morfield, it's also for Xant too later. We get our ball and chain. This is all really the only reason we came here. We need ball and chain to beat Xant. But before we go, there's a, some really convenient rupees. As I mentioned, we need 300 rupees to, uh, to, for a city in the sky in order to warp the cannon. We need 300 rupees to repair, to repair it. So we're going to get those one. Uh, there's an orange rupee over there, 100. There's another 100 coming up later. So really just about to get 200 rupees in this dungeon. Really, really convenient. So there's one there, and then there's another one here. There's these two bubbles. You can you can use ball and chain to get to defeat them. And then try to skip the rupee text by side hopping. And now, now that we have fully emptied our bomb bag, now it's time. We have a bomb bag. It's fully emptied. Let's go to lake bed. There's two really convenient chests that have the water bombs. We're only going to get one of them uh, because we don't need the other one. We're just going to get this one. And it gives us 10 water bombs. Better not let, better not wait that, waste them. Those 10 water bombs are the only water bombs we're going to get for the entire run. So better, better make them last. So uh, this is going to look a lot like the very first lake bed trip where we are going to use LJAs to get through this area a bit faster. And then we're going to go beat Morfield. Now, you're supposed to get the boss key, but we're going to skip the boss key. There's a clip you can do. Skip the boss key. <laughs> it 
in general, okay, so there you saw me open the left door, but I promise you it's faster to open right doors. You, the, throughout the whole run, I've been opening doors on the right, but there I like opening the door on the left just because it puts me in a more direct path to this stairs. It's kind of complicated, but basically I like the angle I come, I approach that jump from the left door. But in general, it's faster to open right doors. There's some exceptions, but um, that's because when Link comes out of a door in the game, his animation of opening the door is faster coming from coming from the right versus from the left. Uh, it's by a half second, so I really, uh, because of the, the advantage I think it gives me in that one scenario, I just take my half second time loss and run with it. But in general, right doors are faster. All right, so the Morpheal fight. Fun fact, you only have just barely enough air to sink all the way down. It's really convenient if you even do that. You have frames of air left. We just barely make it to the bottom. Now what we're going to do to refill our air, we're pulling water bottom, water bomb while swimming. That's the glitch that allows you to refill your air. So what I did was you have to be on the you have to be on the bottom. Now you can't be swimming while you start pulling it. So you ha we have to make sure we're on the ground level. And then we pull a water bomb and then very quickly equip an item over the iron boots. Then what that does is that as you're pulling the water bomb, I guess the game doesn't check whether you have the iron boots on still. And then that allows you to swim while you have the water bomb. And so then at any point, if we press A or the water bomb button, it you let go of the bomb and it refills your air. So we're about to see it. We're about to see we're going to let go of the bomb. It's going to completely refill your air. There we go. Now I have a completely fresh air gauge. What I'm going to do is I'm going to equip Iron Boots and then Claw Shot more fuel. What that does is that then if I equip over Iron Boots, that uh, that takes off the Iron Boots. So anytime you equip over Iron Boots while you're using them, it force unequips them. That allows me to get off of Morphil so that Morphil doesn't shake me and launch me up way high. Otherwise, I just drown. There, I refill again using the same trick with the water bomb, and then again put on iron boots and then claw. And then, um, when I have dealt uh, enough damage, I'm going to force unequip iron boots again. And I want to do it as more feel swimming down, and then I can, I have enough air that I can claw shot on again, and then do the ending blow. So, all of that uh, is actually really involved fight. If anything goes slightly wrong, you drown. Uh, that's because uh, if something goes wrong, often you don't have enough time to sink all the way down because I can't pull a water bomb unless I'm at, at the bottom. I have to be all the way at the bottom. So if at any time that I need an air refill, I need to sink all the way to the, down to the bottom and then pull another water bomb and then swim all the way back up to more fuel and latch on. It's really annoying. So that's why there you saw me you saw me sink down once. So I used two bombs. You counted two bombs that I used. There's a way to do the entire fight in one water bomb. But it requires Morphil to swim directly towards you at the start, so that you barely have enough air for not just one regrab, but two regrabs. So what we would do is we would it would we would latch on, regrab, and then regrab again. But instead, what I did was I latched on, I forced on equipped iron boots, sink all the way down, then refilled my air with an with a water bomb, and then went back up, and then latched on, and then regrabbed. But the problem with doing one one bomb is that you just barely have enough air for those two regrabs. It really requires a very, very late air refill. And if Morphil doesn't swim towards you fast enough, then, then by the time you've latched on, you don't have enough air to do both regrabs. So most of the time you're going to see two, two, uh, two bombs used. Uh, but I, but uh, there, I, there I used two. It loses 15 seconds. There I just lost 15 seconds to using uh, two bombs instead of one. But you know, like I mentioned, it's RNG and it's very risky because if you drown, the run's just over. So I just got the heart container. That's going to be useful not here, but way, way, way later in the run. Uh, when I reach Palace of Twilight, it's actually really the only place I really care much. Palace of Twilight, there's a lot of damage that is dealt to you in Palace of Twilight. And yes, you can skip that air, that heart container, but it's pretty risky. It's really, really risky. There's a lot of times where I would have died in Palace of Twilight otherwise. Kind of notice there, it's kind of funny. I had to force transform after that cutscene. Uh, into human, not uh, into wolf. It's weird because normally when you beat lake bed, you are wolf because Zant transforms you into wolf, and uh, and then you have to save midnight, and then you go get the master sword. But I guess because we already have the master sword, so normally you get the master sword right after this, then you go back to the sacred grove and get master sword. Then well, not back to the well, really to the sacred grove for the first time, but uh, we already have the master sword, so I guess. 
the game just doesn't transform you into wolf if you already have a master sword so then we have to physically transform because as i mentioned wolf speed is a lot faster through these big areas than human so we don't want to roll through these areas we move way faster as wolf but i just find it funny that we have to physically transform even though midna's sick poor midna she's like she's just she just goes through so much. First, she gets really sick because of Xan, and now she's making you. Now she's forced to make Link transform with her little magic left. Like, poor Minda. All right, so here again, dash canceling. So pressing A B over and over again. That's the fastest way to move through this area specifically. We Castle Town. We're gonna head over to Telma's Bar. Another thing you might have saw and seen just there is that I B attacked uh, instead of jumping. And that's an area where B attacking as wolf is faster than the jumping animation. And there's a few places in the game. Dungeons is where you're mostly going to see it, where Link's jump speed is less than his B attack speed. Now, what there I just tried to do is I tried to do a frame perfect B attack. Uh, I didn't get it there, but uh, it, it saves about a second where this cutscene, you see all these camera pans? Well, you can, if you do a B attack at the correct time, a neutral B attack, coming from Talma's bar, you can activate this cutscene with a fixed camera angle. And that basically skips all these camera pans, all of them that save, that take a few frames to happen. And all those camera pans skipped saves about a second or so. But did not get it, it's frame perfect. All right, gotta be really careful not to jump down here by accident. Jumping down here means you get caught and you have to get thrown out. And we're gonna fight our first Poe. Gonna see a bunch of Poes later in Arbiter's Groans. Alrighty, so, we're gonna be heading to the sewers. So, here's another way that early Master Sword saves time coming up here, that in this next area, you're supposed to, as Wolf, burn these two webs. So the first web's not really a problem, but it's actually the second web that is a problem. The reason the second web is a problem is that you have to defeat the keys because Link can't physically climb as Wolf if he's looking at enemies. So you have to defeat those keys in order to climb with the well while holding the stick specifically, specifically while holding the stick. So it's actually faster to skip fighting the keys and instead be human, become human, transform and use the lantern because otherwise Link could not climb while holding the stick. All right, this guy we have to defeat. Uh, there is a, <laughs> technically you don't have to defeat him, but uh, most of the time, if you don't defeat him, like the vast majority of the time, he'll knock you down from the rope. And then there was a there was a, a jump that you saw, a kind of precise jump to skip going across that first rope. So here is when you get knocked down if that first Bulblin was not defeated. You do a jump attack here to skip some of going across the ropes a little faster. And then here we're going to skip these ropes by jumping across. And technically you can jump attack this guy. I don't prefer doing it. It saves about 0.7 seconds. Uh, but uh, you can do it. It's just if it fails, you fall down. Going to take a specific path to not get hit by that archer. We, we uh, This part, we're on a cycle. We want to reach the bridge as fast as possible. Also, I mean, we want to just have fast movement in general. I'm going to do a, a dash cancel here, uh, because otherwise I'd lose my dash before reaching that ledge. I want to reach this bridge as quick as possible, because then we can jump off of it just before it comes down. We just barely have enough time to reach that, just by frames. That bridge is kind of annoying. Sometimes Link will kind of just tumble when he fall when he reaches the bridge, and then when he, tumble, when he tumbles, he can't jump off, and he'll just fall and void out. It's really unfortunate. It just has bizarre collision. So anyway, that is the Midna's Desperate Hour. We have saved Midna.
So back outside to Hyrule Field, outside of Castletown. We're gonna go uh, to that Golden Wolf that we had activated earlier when we howled at the Songstone before Iza. It's a little faster to claw shot here, but it only by a little bit. Now you may notice Link just grabbed on with two hands. That's actually really important. So when you claw shot, it's random whether Link grabs on with one hand or two hands. And that's important for when you want to climb. So climbing is faster if you, uh, after claw shotting, if you grab on with two hands. Because with one, Link has to steady himself and then grab on with a second hand and loses about a second or so. But it's random. It's a 50-50 chance. That's another example of RNG in the run. So we're going to talk to the Hero Shade and we're going to get the... The very first hidden skill is the only one we're going to get. This is the ending blow. And as I mentioned before, the ending blow is required to defeat Ganondorf. Otherwise, you literally could not beat the game. So, normally, you're supposed to have gotten this hidden skill right outside of Forest Temple, but uh, we got it from Castletown, but it just wrong warps you here, funny enough. Because that's where the game thinks you're supposed to have gotten it. That's where you normally do get it. But yeah, we could not have gotten that there, I believe, because you have to clear fair in Twilight. And we did not clear fair in Twilight, so you can't get the hero shade there. Not 100% sure if that's correct, but... Time to climb some ladders. You've been seeing this throughout the run, we saw it there again. Jump attacking over ledges. Is faster than climbing them if the ledge is low enough that you can actually jump attack up. They say that as wolf and as human. And you see me turning before transforming. So when Link transforms, he uh, from from wolf to human and from human to wolf, the position of the of Link when he is wolf is his hind leg. So I want Link. I I just need to make sure that I know that Link as a human will be standing up where Link's, where Wolf Link's hind legs are. So for these ladders, I wanna make sure that I turn to put Link's hind legs next to the ladder so that when I transform into human, I'm next to it. Otherwise, if I didn't turn, then Link would be a little further away from the ladder and I have to walk up to the ladder before climbing. So it saves a really small amount of time, but it's something that I do. You're gonna see that later in the run. There's a B attack there to make sure I don't lose my dash. And there, you also see, this is something you've seen throughout the run as well. Before transforming, it's faster to see up. So that is from wolf to human. And that's only true if Minda's on Link's back. The reason is that if Minda is on wolf Link's back before you transform, if you if you just transform without C upping, there will be this camera pan that pans onto Midna before her talking to you in order to let you transform. And that is skipped if you C up. So I, uh, yeah, up is actually a great movie. You guys should see it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so go into first person, then call Midna, and that skips that camera pan. It saves a few frames. Again, this is just vectoring, making sure that I am moving as directly as a path as possible. So you can jump over this gap here, and then I want to make sure I am taking an exact correct path towards where I'm trying to go. So what are we normally supposed to do here? Normally, you're supposed to defeat one of these uh, these riders or these boars, and then you're supposed to ride the boar through this fence and break it. But we, got, we went to Snow Peak before Arbiters, and that that got us the ball and chain and so now we can do a skip instead we can instead the very first fence we can actually knock down the side part of it with the ball and chain 
And then the second part we can clip through. Only possible with the ball and chain, that is. So we get past this, ball and chain. Then the next part we can just clip through. It's a it's a, this really tight area we can just squeeze right through. Alright, heading to the bulb and camp. So as I mentioned before, the map glitch. The map glitch was used to get to Snow Peak early. What map glitch does by well to activate it, you have to call Midna on the same frame as pulling up the map. And so what that does is that allows me to interrupt warping by calling Midna. Now all loading zones and void planes are deactivated. So I can't void out if I fall out of bounds. What we're gonna do is we're gonna perform an LJA to get to this this uh this top part of this mountain. There's this corner with this very tight corner we can just barely land on. Just on the edge. And now we can run around out, out of bounds here. And then what we can do is we can here we don't void out. We can do a jump attack. Jump attack gives us a lot of speed to reach the bottom uh, that triggers this fight. So basically we trigger the fight without opening. Normally you're supposed to get the small key. You're supposed to get the small key in or and then open the area to, and then trigger King Bulbin. Well that trigger goes all the way under the map. So what we did was just trigger it from under the map. And as I mentioned, I didn't void out because map glitch prevents me from voiding out. Now in that fight, very important, you saw uh, that fight was over really quickly. I did a bunch of counterclockwise spins and they triple hit. So only counterclockwise spins triple hit King Bulbin. So the, the direction that I do a spin attack matters a lot. Now, just for any regular enemy where it doesn't matter, clockwise spins are the fastest. Now, the reason for that is that clockwise spins are take one less frame to finish than counterclockwise spins. So for King Boblin, you can only triple hit with counterclockwise spins. But for other enemies, it's faster to do clockwise spins because it's one frame faster per spin attack. So I'm actually going to be... Uh, I am ambidextrous with my spins. I can spin the stick either direction for spin attacks. I think a lot of other people in the community kind of just like to stick to counterclockwise because counterclockwise works for anything, but switching to clockwise for just a few of them just saves a few frames throughout the run. And I can do either, so it, it doesn't bother me. All right, entering Arbiters. So Arbiters has a lot of sand. Uh, we're going to sand when you enter it. It slows you down. Now, if you're rolling, we're going to see right here, doing a landing roll, you can land, you can roll through sand. But as soon as your roll ends, you lose a lot of your speed. You only keep your speed for the entire time you roll. So here we're going to see, we're going to go all the way to the edge and then roll as late as possible. That way I'm rolling as I'm moving through the sand, I don't lose my speed. That's one way we can get through sand. Uh, but for sand that's really extended, like really, really far extended, we're going to see a different way you guys pass it. Again, there, see I do a late roll, I roll all the way across the sand, and then I can reach the other side with all of my speed. Uh, but yeah, that's not going to work for every single part, but that does work for a bunch of different places. Here, you're going to see it again, roll across the sand, and we're going to roll again across the sand. You can't roll while you're in the sand. You can only roll... It's basically going from island to island. You're rolling while you're on an island, and then you're rolling across it, and hopefully the roll gets you across. It has enough distance. But as I mentioned, there's some places where the sand is too wide. There's no way we can roll all the way across it. And then you lose... I mean, you basically go to zero speed. Run, going through sand, you drown really quickly, You lose, and, and you also have, like, basically no speed. So uh, we will see other ways. So in this next room, we're actually going to... There's a skip we're going to do, and it's going to involve going across the sand. Basically, these four poses... It's very OT, like, an awkward of time, where there's supposed to be these four poses, and you need to defeat them to open the door. Now, we're only going to defeat three of them. We're going to skip this first one. By doing this room in a very wrong order, it's called... We have to call this Poe 1 skip, so I just skip fighting that Poe. You're normally supposed to fight that first. What we're going to do is we're going to LJ across and then jump off this pillar in a very precise area to get this jump. And that jump allows me to reach this area very, very, very early. And so as you saw, I did an LJA to get across the sand. And then I ran up to the pillar and then I clipped up and then jumped up. But basically, we're, we're, we're now doing this room... This room uh, we're gonna do these rooms kind of not at all in the intended order like not at all remotely close to the intended order in this dungeon And you're also not supposed to have ball and chain in this dungeon either So 
I skipped the first po. Also nice. I meant to. You could see how annoying sand is. I did not mean to go into the sand there. I meant to uh, light that torch, but kind of missed it. Uh, but the other thing about sand that's interesting is that you can also B attack through it as wolf. So I can just, as wolf, at any time I can press B. And that refreshes your height. So you can indefinitely go through sand as wolf. It's really cool. It's really funny that you can do that. There, I do it again. Just B attacking. For some reason, Nintendo allows you to B attack. But this is Poe 4. This is supposed to be the last... Uh, this is supposed to be the last Poe you fight. There's a minip here we can do. Depending on what pattern we get, there's a minip we can do. Um, all these four different uh, spawns have a different minip. And that basically makes it so there you saw the Poe start spinning quickly as fast as possible. Here again, out of out of bonds, out of bounds spawn. I lured the Poe to the door. That way, I kill the Poe as close to the door as possible. Um, and then, if you get an out of out of bounds spawn there, which is a fifty percent chance, then you need to spin attack at the correct time, which luckily I got. But if you miss the spin attack, the Poe hits you, which is really unfortunate. Uh, that spin just barely works. Now we're gonna get the Poe scent. This is important because uh, we need the Poe scent in order to get the remaining post. We need to be able to dig, and you can't dig without the Poe scent. So we're learning the Poe scent. We'll do that later. Now, we're going to uh, have to push this block all the way. Because we're going to have to come back through this area later uh, to get to the, uh, the the I believe it's the third Poe. We're going to run past the third Poe. We need to get that chest to get enough. We need enough rupees. I need 60 more rupees from three different red rupees. So that block, I have to push it all the way, otherwise it will go back to its original position, which blocks me. So I just opened the shortcut to get back to that room. Now we need to get the small key and the remaining pose. So there's a door that, in order to get to the po, the third pose, the door is locked. So we have to go through here and get the small key. And while we're here, we're going to go ahead and get the pose too. The, the single pose, just one, just one. So this is pose two. But you're supposed to have learned the pose and from the first Poe, not from Poe 4. <laughs> so, <laughs> very out of order. So, there's the small key. Now, this this uh, this redead drops a red rupee, very convenient. Getting us to our 600 rupees, or uh, 300. We only need one more red rupee, and there's luckily one more red rupee in the dungeon to give us another 20. So here we go, here's the next Poe, the Poe 2. I'm gonna try to do a frame perfect dash here. There's a one frame window I can dash towards the door. I didn't get it there, but the, the idea is to d there's a one frame window between those two concedes that I can dash. That just moves Wolf a little bit. Oh, nice wall. <laughs> what I'm gonna attempt to do here is, uh, when I'm pushing this, uh, this, uh, this thing, this switch, I want the rat to hit me as I'm pushing it. That does, it allows me to move, and it continues pushing on its own. So you only have to get it started, and then if you get hit, it actually cancels you having to wait for Wolf Link to be done pushing it. So you can move as it's being pushed. Saves a few seconds there. I like to call that speed rat. Alright, now we're heading to the... Third and final Poe, which, uh, you know, just avoiding that one guy. Too too bad. He, he wants friends, but unfortunately, he just doesn't have any friends today. So, uh, only three Poes we are defeating. And so, this is going to be something really interesting. So, we're going to go across this chandelier, and then I got that small key. You're supposed to open this door from the other direction, but... We're now basically opening, we unlocked the door from behind. Really fine. We're, we're not doing these rooms at all in the correct order. That we We're doing this way, way out of order. Like you're supposed to come from this room from the, a complete other direction. We're coming from the complete wrong direction. So we're going to defeat this re-dead. Have to defeat him. He's really annoying. He screams at you if you don't defeat him. So, And then we're going to pull the chain... And then get the red rupee. Gotta be really careful not to pull that chain through the sand. You can't pull chains while in the sand. I'm gonna defeat this last Poe. Now, very unfortunately, I uh, targeted the wrong guy. And that made me miss my uh, ending blow on the 
Poe. So one of the funny mistakes in the run had to defeat the Poe again, but unfortunately doesn't didn't really lose that much time. And then try for the frame perfect dash. Let's see if I get it. All right, did get that one. So there we go. So that's what I was trying to do on the other one. So there's that one frame where I can input a dash. Gets me closer to the door that I'm trying to go to. Now we're going to head back. Going to B attack and then dash. That makes me uh, dash cancel off this ledge and then I can instantly dash again. Another example of making sure I do not lose my dash. And also, you might have seen that whenever I go, whenever I jump off of a ledge, I get more speed when I B attack. So I'm about to B attack here off of this ledge, so I get more speed than jumping. There, B attack, get more distance. So this area, we're going to do it from reverse. So we're actually going to get the boss key before fighting the mini boss. The only place where you really see us do it. There's, as Wolf, you can kind of just go around the edge here, and now we can go through the sand. And as I mentioned, B attacking a bunch of times through the sand, you can just get through the sand as Wolf. And now, we have the boss key, and then we're going to go backwards. So normally you're supposed to use the spinner to get to the boss key. Well, now we're going to get the boss key and then go to the spinner. It's the exact opposite direction of what we're supposed to do. This is really cool movement we can do. Uh, we can stay human this entire time. Uh, normally it's just to transform as wolf and then go all the way around, but there's this really cool movement. And you see a brake slide there. So a brake slide is another way to get across sand. And it's we're going to use it here to get across a really big area. So what is a brake slide? So a brake slide is basically holding target and slightly down at the end of a roll. What that does is it converts your speed to negative. Uh, well, normally your speed is positive. And basically negative speed cannot decay in sand like positive speed does it doesn't work the same way and basically you just keep negative speed for a lot longer so that's how brake slides work we can use it here again to get through the sand this is slightly faster than claw shotting again a brake slide to get across the sand it kind of just looks like link is like moving backwards even though he's moving forwards that's really characteristic of, of brake slides we really don't use brake slides throughout the run, but you see them a lot in the TAS, the TAS, because brake sliding is faster going up hills, but only by frames, and it has to be perfect, because negative speed makes you move up slopes faster than positive speed. So you don't really see it much in the speed run, but the TAS, you see it basically everywhere. So, here is the Death Sword mini boss. We're actually not going to beat the Death Sword mini boss. What instead we're going to do is we're going to do this big super jump that's really, really precise to reach the ledge to jump over the wall that's supposed to open up after beating the mini boss. So it's really position precise. Very, very position precise. And we also have to wait for Death Sword to be in the correct position as well. It only works, I believe it's one frame. <laughs> Well, there we go. That that jump works only by pixels. It really just barely, barely, barely works. Allows us to skip the mini boss. Saves about 20 or so seconds. So now we're going to save and quit. So instead of using the spinner to get back uh, to the beginning of the dungeon, it's way faster to save work. Plus, I think we're just locked in. I, I think we might just be locked in. I don't think we can leave because we didn't beat the mini boss. That would be true too. But even if we beat the mini boss, we would we would save and quit. It's faster. And then now we can use spinner to get across the sand. Very convenient. Another roll there. A very late roll to get across the sand. You have to do that very, very, very late. More rolling to get across sand. Now we're headed all the way back. Now that we have the spinner, we can, and we have the boss key, we can beat the dungeon. So we didn't beat the mini boss. Well, we're not gonna beat the boss either. So don't beat any bosses at all in this dungeon. They're both, they both are kept alive. So Stallard, Stallard skip was, uh, this is the bo the boss. We're just gonna be skipping him. This, for a very long time, was not possible at, for humans. It took a really long time and a lot of work on this setup because this setup really is insanely complex. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of variables. It's a very elaborate, long setup. But I'll give you the gist of it. 
So when you claw shot an enemy, you can perform something called claw shot actor displacement. And that's basically the whole, that's the, the meat and bones of this entire trick. It all falls off of cl claw shot actor displacement. So when, when you are in this fight, there are these style troopers that form. With the claw shot actor displacement, you can move the style trooper anywhere you want. Normally, the style trooper is stationary, but with claw shot actor displacement, if you claw shot and then fall off a ledge by performing an L slide, which allows you to move while claw shotting, you can fall off a ledge as soon as you claw shot the style trooper. And then instead of Link moving to the style trooper, the style trooper moves to Link, which is the exact opposite of what's supposed to happen. And then we can get the style trooper in the corner and then use it to clip out of bounds, not once, but twice. And then the second one's with a bomb boost. So, pretty complex trick. Very involved. Lots of moving parts. Also doing this while Stallard is breathing fire at us. So, you gotta, you, gotta, uh, you can cancel Stallard's attack with the uh, boomerang. You gotta go really fast here. So they were setting up a precise angle and a precise position. And this is all, this all has to be exactly perfect. Then we have to claw shot the style trooper at the exact correct uh, Y angle. Only two pixels work here. And now here's the claw shot actor displacement. We get the style trooper exactly into the corner. Now I'm gonna go ahead and just cancel his fire breath. Now we can do an L slide, which is basically holding target in a direction after claw shotting to get past the first wall. Now I'm going to cancel his fire breath one more time with the boomerang. And then now what I'm going to do is I'm going to claw shot. I'm going to throw a bomb. And then the bomb is going to hit me as I am claw shotting partially out of bounds. So basically when you claw shot right into the wall, uh, Link goes out of bounds for about a three frame window uh, while claw shotting. The bomb hits us while we are out of bounds in that three frame window, allowing us to get past that second wall, and boom, we have skipped Cellward. That trick, I know I made it look really easy, but I promise you that trick is not easy. Now, fun side effects of defeating Cellward. So, this area right here, you're supposed to defeat these shadow beasts and then raise the mirror. Now, really interesting thing, there's two ways that this can be skipped. So, for one, if you had defeated Stellar, what you normally do, so normally you're supposed to raise the mirror, and it's actually really easy to skip raising the mirror. Uh, I guess this is something Nintendo didn't quite realize. It was fixed in the HD version, but you can literally zoom in all the way, activate the portals, and then zoom all the way out, and then you can warp away, and you didn't even activate. You didn't even uh, activate the mirror. But because we didn't even de defeat Stellar, we don't have to do that because I guess that the flag for not being able to warp is defeating Stellar. So because we didn't defeat Stellar, the game doesn't even know we've reached the mirror. It thinks we're still in the Stellar fight and we just warp away. And again, that skips raising the mirror. So that was, uh, well, the zooming in glitch. That was patched in HD. So in HD, they don't, they can't skip Stellar. Uh, because L sliding was patched in HD, so they can't do any of the trick. And, uh, and the way to skip by zooming in was also patched, so you can't do that either. So, uh, HD has to, has to get the mirror raise. So this is the biggest sequence break in the entire game right here. This is the early city in the sky. So if we get to a, a specific angle, a specific position, there's a crack, there's a gap that we can get past. In that statue there, when we transform into wolf, it pushes us forward through the gap. Now we can reach this cannon without doing any of a lot of different things. So first of all, we would have had to go to Temple of Time. And we would have had to do this long quest of uh, with a bunch of owl statues. And there's a girl in the game. She's supposed to get her memory back. Well, we're not going to do any of that. Instead, we just clip past it and get the statue. That, uh, the, the cannon, that saves well over an hour in this speedrun. It saves a lot of time. So that's the biggest sequence break, the early city in the sky. So now, uh, we, uh, as I mentioned before, remember how I had to get map warping way earlier? I had to go to the gorge and activate a cutscene. I would not have been able to warp that cannon if I had not done that. However, I will mention something really interesting. You technically do not have to get map warping from the gorge, but it's really dumb. You have to do something called universal map delay, which is the only way you can warp the uh, the warp the cannon without map warping. It requires you to alternate between A and B every single frame for a, a second or so. Uh, so 30 times per second, you have to press A and B. Not viable for humans, but the TAS does not get map warping. 
Very interesting fact. That was found pretty recently, the universal map delay glitch. But yeah, good luck alternating between A and B every single frame. Like, just good luck doing that. You're, you're not going to be able to do it. It's 30 times a second. So you have to have literally mash 30 times a second. It's not going to happen. And it's frame perfect too. Every single press is frame perfect for that. You, you drop a single one, the entire thing fails. No one's been able to do it. So we pay our 300 rupees, pay the cannon, and we're going to city. So Arbiters was, you know, the first of these three, well, I don't know if you consider Hyrule Castle one, but three long dungeons where we have to go all the way through and beat the dungeon. That'd be Arbiters, City in the Sky, and Pal. So this is really the dungeon rush part of the of the game. So this is the second dungeon. We're going to go all the way through. I'm going to do every, well, I mean, we're not going to do everything in the dungeon, but it's considerably longer than the dungeons we saw at the, sh at the beginning of the game, which were a lot shorter. So we're gonna get out of this water. Gotta be cognizant of when the wind's blowing. Sometimes the wind, it's RNG when the wind blows. There's two different patterns you can get in different areas. There's a fast and a slow. There I got a, a, a slow wind pattern, which is good because then I can roll through and not have to be stopped by the wind. Now we're supposed to get Ukus. We're supposed to take Ukus through these area areas and float across. But again, I have the LJA. I can just jump across. And now, here's a sequence break I'm gonna do here. So I'm gonna go up to this door and open it from pretty far away. So that's gonna skip the ground trigger. The, this fan in this room, if you look up, you can see it. This fan's supposed to start spinning when you enter this room. But if you open that door from far away, you actually skip the trigger. And now, that fan's never gonna spin. And that's gonna be really useful for getting the boss key early. Because that fan's normally blocking you from getting the boss key. We're gonna come back through later and get the boss key. It's faster to do it later instead of here. So we're going to use the spinner and uh, make this bridge go across. Now at the very end, I can take off the spinner. I can get off the spinner and perform a roll very quickly. I have enough time to do that and it'll still go all the way across. You got to time it correctly. If you go too early, the bridge does not uh, does not finish latching. And then you have to get on the spinner again and do the entire thing all over again. Uh, get And it, take, it loses about 15 seconds. So don't want to go too early. Don't want to get off the spinner too early or else it does not work. And then you have to move the bridge all over again. So we're going to get the small key. Now, fun fact, this small key is skippable, but again, not humanly viable. It requires a bunch of actor displacement, and it is very complex and very difficult. And uh, it is actually done in the, the, uh, the individual level, but it requires the jump strike. That is the only way that has been found to be humanly viable, and it's still very, very difficult. But TAS can skip this even without the jump strike. Again, not humanly viable. Actually, in Gymnast Tass, he uh, basically said if anybody can get it as a human, he'll give him $100. So good luck getting that. So skip here. So normally there's supposed to be a cutscene that plays when you re-enter this area of Argorok breaking the bridge. But if I do that parkour there, I can actually go around that trigger. That's also going to change my save warp location. When I save and quit, normally you go to the beginning of the dungeon uh, because after you trigger that cutscene. But instead, when I save and quit, I'm actually going to go into that small key chest again. So it's going to mess with my save flags doing that skip. But yeah, that, that cutscene of Argot breaking the bridge is about 30 seconds. So saves a decent bit of time to skip that cutscene. Nice. <laughs> this area um, did not go that great. <laughs> You're about to see why. Well, that too. I had trouble killing the Baba. And then, um, remember I was saying I'm trying to get off the spinner right as the bridge goes across? Well, I just got off too early. And now I have to... I have to then move the bridge again, which loses 15 seconds. So yeah, I just got off the spinner too early. So there you go. Now you see what happens if you get off too early. I was just trying to get a roll off, but went too early. We'll try it again. I'll get it this time. There we go. Nice. There we go. Just meant to do that the first time. But 
There you may have noticed I'm holding boomerang in my hand. I've actually done that a few times, but basically you can pull an item on a door, basically press the item and then open the door very quickly so that you don't pull it out. Uh, that allows you to have it in your hand because now Link throws the boomerang faster if it's in his hand. That's only true for third person throws, not for first person throws. So I don't really do that that often, but just something to note. Here you can LJA off of the enemy itself, the tile worm. And then, very interesting, that updraft has to be going. That updraft will push you to the side. That way the tile worm doesn't launch you into the air. Really funny, you can get these guys to kind of just jump down. If you claw shot at the correct time, they kind of just fall off. It's because they're trying to avoid your claw shot, but it makes them fall to their doom. It looks really funny. So, gotta get Uku. Gotta use Uku to take this updraft across. So, gonna take Uku up, and I jumped early. <laughs> so, didn't have enough height. Uh, we'll, we'll just try it again. There we go. There we go. Can also claw shot Uku. And I'm also using iron boots to drop while holding Uku. And there's a sequence break you can do here. You can jump off the very corner of this area, and then you have just barely enough height to let go and then grab this sludge. Skips uh, opening up some of the fans. And then there's another jump you can do here. Normally you're supposed to drop down with Uku with iron boots on, but instead you can just barely make this jump with a jump attack. You take two hearts of damage, so deals a lot of damage there. So you need to make sure you have enough two hearts to survive that that fall. And here I'm gonna mash to put on iron boots, see if I get it. There we go. There's a one frame window you can put iron boots on there. That way you don't have to put it on uh it, you're, it's already on because then we want to we, we we drop faster while we have iron boots on so there's a lot of times in the run we're gonna we see you see we put on iron boots while midair this is because link drops faster while he has iron boots on and there's a sequence break here we're not actually going to beat this uh this mini boss instead we're gonna skip the Arathos fight by doing a pixel perfect claw shot there to reach that claw shot target allowing us to enter the uh the uh, area that's supposed to open after you beat the mini boss and get the double claw shot. Now we're stuck, but luckily we can save and quit and escape. And you can just go back to... Now, again, normally it's supposed to be the start of the dungeon, but because we skipped that Argorok breaking the bridge cutscene, it actually takes us back to the small key chest. That's where we're gonna go, the small key chest. Make our way back. So, now we have the double claw shots, as opposed to the single claw shot. Now, this cutscene's not gonna trigger this time. It only triggers that first time you go through, so don't need to worry about the... Don't need to worry about parkouring twice. Now, this is very important. As I mentioned before, we did a skip where we opened the door entering this area from as far away as possible so that actually we skip the trigger for this fan starting to spin. So now we can perform a big sequence break oh, uh, where we, we actually can, this fan, see it's not spinning? So we can head up here, skip going all the way around to get up here to the boss key chest. It's a big, big sequence break to do that. Now we're supposed to take these ropes outside to go all the way around. There's a really precise claw shot you can do there. Then we can just LJA to skip the ropes. Now, as I mentioned, so here's the boss key. As I mentioned, the, the fan's not spinning. That does create a problem because the outside area over here to get to basically the boss door you're supposed to you're supposed to claw shot double claw shot between these spinning fans 
but they're not spinning. So there's the last one, it's facing the wrong direction. Because it's not spinning, you can't claw shot it. So we can claw shot the first two. We're actually gonna claw shot high enough up that Link grabs. We're gonna claw shot really, really high up. So he's gonna grab and climb. But this last one, we're gonna do this really, really flashy double LJA to get across. Because otherwise, you could not get across. Because they're not spinning. There we go, and now we have reached the fan tower. So there's gonna be a lot of double claw shotting here. When I double claw shot, you see I'm actually firing off the claw shot before entering first person. That allows me to enter first person faster. I'm doing that because there's another way you can enter first person faster by holding target, but I can't do that because I'll target the Aralfos. So this, in, in, uh, for the very first part when we're low enough to target the Aralfos, I'm going to fire off the claw shot to enter first person faster. Just mashing the button. See, so yeah, I enter first person faster there. Do it. And the here, I hold target and then release. And that enters first person faster. And I'm going to do it again here. So the, that's how you enter first person faster. Do it again there, hold target, and then release. And that enters first person faster for double claw shotting. So you can double claw shot faster. Save some time. Here I want to claw shot as low as possible on this target. That way I'm facing towards the door when I fall. And again, falling with boots, because iron boots makes you fall faster. I've been doing that bunch throughout the run. Alright, so normally you're supposed to do two different claw shots to get to this boss. By the way, there's a frame perfect roll you can get there. And we're going to go as far as to the ledge as possible, and just barely we can latch on all the way up top. It's kind of precise, so it takes me a good bit of time to line up, but yep. I'm gonna go all the way up. Now, you gotta be really, really careful with that, especially. If I were too far right or too far left, at the very exact edge, I would get something called Dead Pixel, which basically means Link, instead of climbing, he would enter Double Claw Shot again. And then I have to Claw Shot something else. Well, there's nothing to Claw Shot there, so I'd have to just drop because I can't climb, and that would make me void out, which is really bad. So, don't want to get Dead Pixel. Uh, that make, happens if you claw shot the furthest left or furthest right pixel. Uh, there I just did a manip on Argorok. I went to the edge of the of the arena, and then uh, that manipped Argorok to fly back instead of doing a uh, a different kind of attack. And, and then I can very quickly claw shot up. I can claw shot onto one of these, and then get Argorok just before Argorok starts flying away. It's it's pretty it's pretty tight. But you can you can uh, you can claw shot up and then claw shot again. That way it's a one cycle. Alrighty, heading into the second phase. So, the second phase, we're actually gonna just jump off and void out on purpose. That's because Argorok at the beginning is supposed to fly away and then come back. But if you void out, then Ar that'll prevent that from happening. We just void out. Looks really funny, but that is deliberate. And now we can go ahead and start claw shotting up. So we can actually claw shot up in two claw shots. We're supposed to do multiple, but if we j if we claw shot high enough and far enough to the left on the first one, we can reach high enough up to get it in two claw shots. So now there's a manip we can do here. If we sink low enough, we can cancel the flyer. So we, we sink really low, and then we claw shot again, and that cancels Argorok's fire. We can claw shot a few more times, and then we'll be able to get into Argorok. So that's true for the very first two times. So they're gonna look identical. And this with Iron Boots on, so that we can sink lower. That way, you know, because as I mentioned, get low enough, and that cancels the flames. So this is the exact same thing. The 
cancel the flames by sinking really low, and then, then claw shot it. And then the last one's gonna be different. So the last one, what we're gonna do instead, is it's like we're actually gonna not start with iron boots on. Now I am putting on iron boots before claw shotting these pillars because I'll get blown away by the gust of the wings flaps. But then I take it off now, so I take it off. Now we're gonna claw shot four times around. Then we're instead gonna do, is we're gonna wait for the flame to get near Link. Pretty decently close. It has to get close enough. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna sink below the flame so that it misses us. And then our rock's gonna turn all the way around. And then all we have to do is just not take off Iron Boots until the flame has... Until uh, our rock fires again. And then being that low, again, cancels the fire. Take off Iron Boots, and then that has canceled it, and then we can hit our girl. Uh, so yeah, that is the Argrok fight. Now, fun fact about this cutscene. This cutscene right here can be skipped, but it's only been done with a corrupted disc, or a corrupted really disc reader. There is somebody in the community by the name of Ethernet Boys who's able, be able to get it where somehow I guess the disc gets misread and he Link just, instead of watching this cutscene, he just falls off our rock and this entire cutscene is skipped. But it's considered hardware manipulation and he's not able to control it happening, it just kind of just randomly happens. But we still to this day don't really know what causes it. But it only happens to him. Nobody else. So, very important, we gotta get this hurt container, because we are coming up on Palace, <clears throat> and there's a lot of damage we're about to take. We're about to take a bunch of damage. So, need full health. That heart container gives us full health, because it refills our health. And now we have five heart containers, which is decently safe. Uh, you can skip the Morphil heart container, but that one you can't skip. You cannot skip the, the city heart container, because then not have enough health for what we're about to do. So I'm going to put on iron boots and claw shot into the cannon. So normally when you fire back down to like Hylia, you're supposed to land in the water. But if you put on iron boots and then jump attack as soon as possible, you can land short enough that you land on the bridge because otherwise you'd overshoot it. And that's important because you can't, you cannot warp in the water. You have to be on the land. So this puts us on land so we can warp as soon as possible. Now I've taken two hearts of damage. Now I'm down to three hearts. So that is a mandatory two hearts of damage you take there. It's a lot of damage. Now, Palace of Twilight. So, fun fact, we didn't actually collect all of the mirror shards. We only collected, well, the one from City, but that's the only one that matters. So we don't have to get the ones from, uh, we don't have to get the one from, uh, Palace of Twilight. And we don't have to get the one from Snow Peak. We only have to get the one from City in the Sky, because that's the only one the game keeps track of. And we get Enter Palace, so we're the only one near Shard. So Palace has these two different, well, three different ways you can go. Left, middle, and straight. You're, you are required to go left first. Because you literally cannot reach the right side without having gone to the left side first. <clears throat> so there's a cool strat there that I did to double hit the Xan head to kill it a lot faster with the Minda charge. Requires correct positioning. So here's something cool I'm going to do. I'm going to put on Iron Boots and drop and then not even take them off and then just transform and then Link is just going to automatically take off his boots when he becomes Wolf. Because otherwise I'd have to take off Boots midair, but I don't have to worry about it there because he just takes them off anyway as Wolf. I need to be Wolf in this room. So, unlike the chest in the other room, this one, you can actually 
jump from the test from the chest to the the next platform by jump attacking off of it. So that's what we're gonna do here. While the other one we claw shot. Now we're going to do our first Phantom Zam fight. There's two and they're exactly identical. With Phantom Zant, there's like a there's a specific way you want to defeat him. You don't want to deal too much damage on each spawn. So there is a way to do a one cycle, but it's not really humanly viable. But uh, instead, we're going to be doing three cycles. So the way to do it is for the first two, you spin attack. You do it. You do a, a a stab and two spins, and then we do the same thing. Do not do not want to do too many spins, or else he transforms a bunch of times, or not transform, teleports a bunch of times throughout throughout the room. Now the third one, forward stab, and then and then three spins. And here, making I'm doing clockwise spins because it's faster than counterclockwise. Counterclockwise takes one additional frame on each spin to to go through. And then we're gonna go ahead and do our escort mission for these souls. Claw shotting this from extra far away so I don't have to move that close to it. it saves a bit of time because I'd have to then move towards it and then move away from it. So I wanna be as far away as possible when I claw shot it. And then here we see more L slides. There's again another L slide. L sliding just moving it just a tiny bit of distance. So that uh, I uh, I can move while claw shotting the soul. It's a really small time save. Another interesting thing we're gonna see here. So I know where this platform forms after throwing the soul into the the whole thing. So I'm just gonna get onto the very end of the platform, so that when it rises up, I um I don't have to go all the way around. I'll just be exactly in correct position so that it rises up and brings me to the top. A lot faster than moving all the way around. Another L slide, and then for some reason, the uh, the enemies that are supposed to spawn there don't spawn if you L slide. Very interesting. You kind of like skip over the trigger. It's really weird that it happens that way. Gotta avoid all of these enemies. Gotta make sure because you get hit, you drop the soul, and then it's really annoying. So, gotta make sure do not get hit by anything while you're while you're carrying this thing. So, we're done with the left side. We've finished our first soul escort mission. We have to bring another one over before we can upgrade our sword. Now here, instead of taking the floaty platform over, we can do it- we can do an LJ, a big super jump to get over. This next room is very annoying. Uh, there's a lot of platforming you have to do in this room while defeating the Xan head. And if you fall down, it's really bad. So, um... And there's five different spawns you can get. And these keys can hit you before claw shotting. So here, I actually get the hardest spawn, which is in the middle platform. I have to jump attack it in midair, and then continue platforming. Really hard strat there, but I was really glad that I got that. That is a very hard spawn. Because the platforming is very tight there, and it's very tight to get that jump attack off. You saw that he barely did not hit me with that ball. If he hits you with the ball, it's, it's pretty bad. So luckily, I was able to defeat him before he got the ball off. Now here, we're going to throw the boomerang as soon as we jump. That's going to lure these shadow beasts towards me. So they all come towards me, and then I can just triple hit them with this charge attack. Then we're gonna defeat this guy, though unfortunately I released this charge early. Uh, I did a spin attack instead of a midnight charge. Oops. But it's okay, just wait for him to respawn. It's really cool, we can do a bunch of double hits on those guys. I just barely have enough time to claw shot this target before the cutscene starts. Then I wanted to claw shot at the top of it, because then I can claw shot directly over here, because I have enough height to reach that target. That takes me 
to the chest. Otherwise, I'd have to claw shot extra targets. Then here, we can actually LJA over. Now, you're in... You're, uh... Intended, I think, to drop down and then claw shot. But you can do that LJA to get over there, which is a lot faster. And then, second Zant... Second Phantom Zant fight, exactly the same as the first. No changes. Just want to make sure that I reach Zant in time before he throws his ball, because I don't want him to spawn a bunch of enemies. I'm using surround. I'm using my earbuds to tell what direction he spawns, and I can hear. So I'm I'm using the surround sound. So if he if I hear him in my left ear, then I know he spawned on the left side. Because you know he doesn't always spawn on camera. So got to hear which way he spawns. Because you got to reach him really quick. So you got to react really quickly. And last soul escort. This one I'm not going to L slide away from because that ball, you can't grab it in your hand if you're too far away. You just won't be able to clash at it from that far away. So you actually do have to get close to it. And there you saw I did a really late roll to get onto the platform so that I reach it. So I'm rolling during the cutscene and I can reach it after the cutscene and get up onto the platform, which is faster than going all the way around. And then here's another example. I throw the soul and then I uh, am already on the platform as it's raising up. So I don't have to... You see, I don't have to go all the way around. And then if you do this correctly, you can actually get past these platforms really quickly. Jumping is kind of tight. Just barely have enough time to make it. I'm trying to get health because health is still pretty tight. There's still uh, mandatory damage left to take. So I'm trying to get hearts from the keys. Didn't really get any, it's unfortunate, but... The goal is to fill up at least a little bit more. I mean, this health will technically work, but I really want to... I, I'm about to take two more hearts, which will put me down to one heart, which I really don't want. There, I had a one-frame window where I could throw the soul, and that allows me... I can then claw shot it from this platform. I could still claw shot it even if I hadn't thrown it, but throwing it gets it closer and makes, the, makes it easier, and also it's slightly faster because then I don't have to drop it before rolling. Alrighty, and now we upgrade our Master Sword. Now the Master Sword has been infused with the light, and now we can clear fog on our own, and we one-hit Xanheads, which is really lucky because Xanheads up until this point were really annoying to kill, but now they're one-hit with the Master Sword, which is really nice. There's another example where I want frame perfect rolls on this slope because you see how long that slope is. If I lo if I missed a single frame perfect roll really early on the slope, I would have low speed for the entire rest of the slope. So you want to make sure I, I, those that was actually really good. I didn't I dropped a frame perfect roll only once, but at the very end of being on one of the slopes, so I kept my full speed for a very long time. So it's, it's a good speed roll on the slopes. So in theory, there's a big super jump you can do in this room with Keese to get up to the top. Not human viable. I said we're just going to throw these souls, but it is something you can do. It's done in the TAS. Or the TAS. So we're just going to take these platforms over. This is actually a, a health refill we can get right here. And then we're going to do LJA. We're going to get the boomerang to go out of bounds by targeting twice on the wall. And then, it doesn't always happen, but most of the time the boomerang goes out of bounds between the two targets. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, trigger the, 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 the platform to spawn. 
Uh, and then I'm gonna uh, move away. Uh, basically, I want to jump attack to get off the platform as soon as it spawns. Is then it, it saves time because then the next time we get to the platform, it's already ready to go. Otherwise, we'd have to wait for it to start up. So then as soon as we get over to the platform, it'll already be ready to go and start rising. Then there's another LJA we can do here. These two LJAs don't really save much time, but they just save a tiny bit of time to get over here so that we don't have to wait for the platform to go all the way over. Then again, targeting that we want the boomerang to go out of bounds. So we do two targets, and then when it goes between the two targets, goes out of bounds. Again, the, L the LJA does not work unless the boomerang is physically out of bounds. Because that ground is not higher than Link's feet. So, instead, you can get the boss key first. We're actually going to get the boss key later. It works out better with the Zan head cycle, with the Zan head spawning. Uh, we can't make the cycle if we get the boss key first. We have to do this first. I'm going as far right on this platform as possible because that Zan head doesn't spawn unless I'm all the way to the right. Well, it spawns as soon as I reach a certain position. I reach that faster if I'm more to the right. And then I can LJ over here, get her faster. And I can't I can't jump down un and void out until the Zan head is, is exploded, or else I'd have to go all the way back over. That triggers these next Zan heads to spawn. Now I have barely enough time that I can go all the way up and reach and make a certain cycle. Now I just claw shot that that target. You're not supposed to be able to claw shot it, but um, if you uh, you can just barely make it. And then that second target I claw shot high enough that I can then skip another target after that. And then here, to get down from the chest, I'm actually going to do a really late roll. And that late roll doesn't make me transform. Because if you're rolling, if you're actively rolling while you're going through the fog, you can't transform. Otherwise, I'd just transform and fall all the way down and void out. Which would not be good. Not be very good. You can also spin attack the fog, but it's slower to do that. It's faster to just roll through the fog. All right, so done with that room, and then he, this next room is on a big, big cycle. This is a big, big, big cycle. So everything I do in this room matters. I have, all of the movement I do matters because I'm trying to make this early platform cycle, which is pretty tight. It's actually a really precise cycle to make. So I do this really cool sword combo to time uh, beating these shadow beasts because I want to beat them as fast as possible. I want to get the, them as soon as they, they fall down. Then here, I'm going to jump as early as possible to this pillar and then uh, this this platform and then LJA to the next platform by using the boomerang going out of bounds here. And then I can claw shot up. Now that taking this platform versus the right, the left one is only faster with that LJA. There's another platform you can actually take. There's two different routes you can take. The left one's faster if you don't LJA. The right one's faster if you do LJA. So LJA saves a good decent bit of time. You can also LJ8 over here instead of claw shotting. It's kind of risky and only saves a little bit of time. But it's not necessary, so I don't actually do it. Because sometimes the boomerang doesn't go out of bounds. If the boomerang doesn't go out of bounds, you can't LJ8. It's really bad. So anyway, I did make the platform cycle. That was the type platform cycle I was trying to make. And so these two Zan heads, the very first Zan head spawns when you reach a certain part on the platform. But that second Zan head ends up spawning on a cycle based on when the first Zan head dies, which makes a me makes this room pretty complex. And so in terms of timing strats, it's actually really complex to time the strategies. Because it's all based on different cycles happening at the same time. Another LJ here to skip the platform going over, and we're done with that room. So, a bunch of Shadow Beasts, just gonna spawn trap them as soon as they, as soon as they fall down, we're just gonna hit them. Spin attacks. Now, the spin attack has a really extended hitbox, as you may see. We can spin attack really early, and it still hits them. It looks like it shouldn't, but it still does. It just, the spin attack has a really long-lasting hitbox. There we go to the Zant boss fight. The Zant boss fight is a pretty cinematic boss fight. It takes you through 
a bunch of different rooms, uh, a bunch of different boss room, mini bosses and boss rooms that you've been in in the game. Now, what's really funny is that the first two, uh, we actually, well, the first two and one other, we actually never went there in the speed run, but I'll tell you which ones they are. <laughs> now, for Zant, uh, when we deal damage to Zant, the only... The only part of Link's sword combo that matters is the fourth hit. So we really don't even care if all the others hit. So often you'll see me do really early sword slashes and deliberately miss because I really only want the fourth one to connect. So this is the Diababa phase. This is the boss of the forest temple. Never beat that. So there you go. See, I only, I really care if the last hit of the combo connects. So I kind of just go early here. Look, I just, every single one of them misses, but the last one, but as I mentioned, the last one's really the only one that matters. All the others don't really deal damage. So this is the, uh, the Goron Mines phase. Uh, here, there's a one cycle we can do. So, what two frame window. Basically what I did on that last hit is I held B and then I released B so that it hits Zant just as he's teleporting away, which is a two frame window. You hit him as he's teleporting away and basically that, that I, I believe what, what it happens is that damage, it thinks it happens after Zant teleported away. Which basically, uh, it thinks it was a two cycle, but it actually was a one cycle. It's, it's something like that. This is the more fuel phase. Again, we need water bombs here, so we're gonna need water bombs to refill on our uh, on our, you know, same thing with the water bombs where we use the glitch to refill our air. Now, one thing to note, you may notice I'm always doing the same sword combo. So I'm doing, I'm holding right, left, up, down for the, the directions. You can't really see it with an input viewer, but that's what I'm holding for the directions for these sword combos. It's very important underwater, especially because that is the fastest sword combo, meaning that is the fastest way for Link to slash his sword. Very important underwater, especially because otherwise we wouldn't even have enough air to do this fight. Uh, the very first part, if we did not do the correct combo. Now, I always know that, uh, basically Zant, it, you have to wait to the correct time, and Zant will spawn in the Zant head across from where you were. So I waited, and then it'll always be directly across from where I was. Here, I equip over the ball and chain, uh, over the, uh, the iron boots to force unequip it. And then, interesting here, you're supposed to bonk. This is the ook phase. You're supposed to bonk these pillars, but you can just ball and chain the last one. And there we were actually using jump spins instead of the uh, the four combo. And it's really the only fight where you see it. That and the and the overall mines phase are the, really the two. You'll see that this again just wanted to make sure that the last combo hits. This is the only this is the only part of the entire game where ball and chain is mandatory. So if you can find a way to get past this phase without ball and chain. You have effectively skipped the ball and chain escape, saved a lot of time in this speedrun. A lot of time. So let's skip going all the way to Snow Peak. Alright, so the last phase, the Hyrule Castle phase. So. Basically, again, just making sure the last hit of the combo hits. And I always know where, like, where Zant's gonna go. So this is kind of this is really consistent. This always works exactly the same way So then you turn around and then he'll spawn behind you and then he does a spin So you cancel the spin attack and then again make sure only the only need the last hit of the combo to hit and Those three hits defeat Zant and that is the Zant boss fight and actually uh, this is the community best that that was the fastest Anybody has ever done the Zant fight that happened in my world record there's a faster strategy you can do for that last phase. I actually didn't do it. I'm having trouble getting it consistent, but basically instead of spin attacking to cancel uh, Zant's spin attack, if Zant misses on the spin attack, he'll then respawn and you can hit him. Uh, he respawns behind you doing his regular attack. Uh, that's faster than canceling it with a spin because he despawns and then spawns again. It's, it's about one sec. It's a little less than a second of time save that it would save, but I don't go for it in runs. Don't need that last heart container. Honestly, health doesn't really matter from this point on the run. Like, we're... We are completely refilled on health, and honestly, I could go through this entire rest of the game without dealing a single heart of damage. Because it's it's really that, um... It's really that lenient past this point. So, heading to the Hyrule Castle. Gonna warp to Castle Town. And... Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall!
So, the Hyrule Barrier. We can finally get past it. But first, we're gonna skip another Mailman Trigger. So, the, uh, this is the same concept as the other Mailman Trigger. Just get close enough to it, and then the boomerang goes out of bounds. If it's off the bridge on the right, we can use that to LJA, go over the trigger, and now we have skipped the Mailman. So, never talk to the Mailman the entire run. Unfortunate. He's a cool guy, but we don't get to do it. We'll never talk to him. There's actually a bonk you can do here into this cutscene. Doesn't lose any time, it just looks funny. Right there. And so people in the community, it's like a it's a trend it's a tradition to bonk there. So if you don't bonk there, the people say that your run is not valid. Unfortunate. Did not get the bonk. Run is not valid. So this right here, this is why Twilight Princess is the longest 3D Zelda speedrun currently. Because this barrier right here is almost impossible to get past. I don't know if it's quite impossible to get past. I mean, you're to decide on that. But people for years have been trying to get past this barrier that Midna is about to tear down. Now, find a way to get past this barrier early in the game. And you can skip the vast majority of this speedrun. This is the Hyrule barrier. This is the very fast, the very last ho holy grail of Zelda speedrunning. So just like the Windmaker barrier, if you guys have seen Windmaker speedrunning, you've seen the barrier skip. It's done in the HD and the GameCube version. It was first found in the HD version. Now it's being done in the GameCube version. It took a while, but it was found. It took many years. That was considered the holy grail of Zelda speedrunning. That was solved. This has been left unsolved. This is also a high a high roll barrier. This one quite a bit harder to get past. You can't use any items in this area. So currently, because it does not exist, I this is a three hour speed run. If we were to somehow figure out a, figure out a way to skip this, we can actually get here really really early. We could skip a lot. I don't know exactly how fast the speed run would be, but quite a bit faster is the answer. It really depends on how it ends up being being skipped. Right now, the current theory on how to skip it is to unload it using actor unloading by duping a bunch of frissing rods, and that will allow you to overload the memory so that it actually doesn't have enough memory to load the barrier. That is currently being worked on it is a work in progress, but currently, as it stands, barrier skip is not a thing, and Twilight Princess is a three-hour game. Uh, you saw that it, like the game kind of lagged there. That's actually when I started my stream, so don't worry. Uh, that's when I started my stream to go live, because this was an offline run. Now it's an online run, because this is when I went live to my audience to show them that I'm getting world record, so. Anyway, high roll. So, there's a bunch of barriers that form with with enemies that you fight. The first one's kind of simple. You just pull a bomb, and it defeats all of these Bokoblins in one hit. We're actually going to be skipping a bunch of other ones, so... This next one, what we're going to do is we're going to, when we trigger the cutscene, we're going to very quickly roll out. You have enough time if you skip the cutscene very quickly. As soon as it starts, you can roll out. And that allows you to be outside of the barrier so that you don't have to do the fight. So, this next one we can't skip. We gotta fight King Boblin. It's important because he gives you the small key, so we have to do this fight. So, do the fight. A bunch of counterclockwise spins, and triple hits. One more, and he's gone. There's a frame perfect backflip you can do here. That would skip a midnight text coming up. It takes about six seconds. Uh, I I don't get it in this run, unfortunately, but right when it the camera pans, you can do a backflip right there. And then you can you can actually save warp midair to skip this text. I'm gonna save warp anyway. It's actually not faster to save warp. It's only faster by it's faster by about a third of a second to backtrack. But I prefer save warping because backtracking risks you getting stuck in that barrier that we 
that we had uh, gotten past earlier, which is really bad. So I just save warp anyway, because I don't I don't really care about doing the movement back. It doesn't really matter. It's about a third of a second. So. Again, gonna take the right door. I don't think it matters there that you take the right door. So there's another barrier skip here. What we're gonna do is we're going to jump attack into the trigger instead of walking into it. And then if you skip the trigger midair, it cancels your speed so you don't actually walk fully into the barrier. Because otherwise, if we were on the ground and we skipped the cutscene, Link would have enough speed to reach inside of it. But if we're midair and we cancel it, it grounds us and makes us lose all of our speed. So, and it allows us to just barely not walk into it and not fight all the enemies. Here we have a Dark Knight fight. This is the only one in the run. Gotta take his armor off. We're gonna do a, a walking, a drive-by attack that basically makes him, uh, he blocks it and we can get behind him. And here we can side up to cancel him throwing the sword at you. And here's a good use of Ball and Chain. So you see the Ball and Chain does a lot of damage to him. So the Ball and Chain... The ball and chain does a lot of damage in this game, so we're actually going to be using ball and chain there and one other place to deal a lot of damage to enemies. Here we can uh, we can get on this this rising platform as it's rising by uh, by making that torch go out with the boomerang, and then very quickly getting on the platform, skipping forming a staircase. That entire puzzle we skip it. And here, luckily, the enemy the the, the enemy the order. For all of these torches is exactly the same. Now, if it wasn't the same, I don't know what we'd do in the speedrun. <laughs> it would really stink. But luckily, it's always the same order. So I already, I already know the correct order for that puzzle. Here we have to defeat these two Lizalfos. It's actually a bunch of different paths you can take through Hyrule Castle, but this is the fastest one. Is to take this path. I can just, just, I just take out a bomb and then explode the bomb and it kills them in one hit. There's actually another way you can do that room where you let the bomb go off on its own. It really is just a matter of preference in which strategy you do. Now we're going to refight Eralphos. Just reminding you of the bosses you fought earlier. And here we're going to use Ball and Chain. We're going to pull it out at a very precise time. Not that precise, but just after he lands, you can pull Ball and Chain and hit him a bunch. And the Ball and Chain does a lot of damage, so... Makes that fight really quick. Versus using the sword. We got the small key, and then we're gonna go get the boss key. While we're in this cutscene, I just kind of want to mention me and who I am and what I do. Uh, I'm Mr. Alberto23. If you haven't met me before, I'm a chill dude. Uh, really, just come and hang out in my streams and comment on YouTube if you feel like it. I mean, I always answer comments on YouTube. Like, I'm, you know... If you have any questions, definitely ask away. This is the first time I've ever really gotten a world record in Twilight Princess. I'm known for speedrunning Windmaker HD. So I came to this game uh, about a year ago, and this is the first time I've ever run this game before. So I had no prior experience. So this, all of this, this, this run, this is after only about a year of speedrunning the game. So it's a really massive accomplishment to be able to pull this off in just a year of running the game. So, and I'm, my goal is sub 250. So, once I get sub 250, my plan is to go to Ocarina of Time 100%, no SRM. And I've never run that before either, so it'll be my first time learning that as well. Yeah, I'm more known for running Windmaker HD. I've actually every, as of the making of this video, I have every single world record on the leaderboard in Windmaker HD. So I'm really well known for speedrunning this game, but not so much this game. So this is a new thing for me. Really me just branching out into other games. So. Alrighty, so we got the boss key, and now we can go and take the final staircase up to Zelda, the fight, and the final fight of the game. And yeah, let's go beat the game. Here you're I really just know the correct path to take here on these sliding boxes I'm getting landing rolls well it allows me to roll across them before they drop down all right now you're supposed to claw shot a few more times than I do here if you stand at the very edge of this platform you can just barely claw shot that torch right there it's pretty precise 
skips claw shotting. I believe two times. Then here on the spinner track, I have to make sure I go at the correct time. So I'm gonna kind of wait a little bit here and then go because I need to make sure these spinner traps don't hit me and they're on a cycle and I know what the cycle is. Then here, if you go close enough, you can claw shot this torch and go right past this fight. It's actually kind of comical this works, but yeah, you can just claw shot and then just make sure you skip the fight. That you skip the cutscene late enough because if you if you mash the button to skip the cutscene you'll just get hit while claw shotting but yeah that claw shot just takes you right past the barrier and you don't have to fight the dark knight so that's pretty nice so final boss so this is a multi-part boss fight it's first gonna start with, with with puppet zelda so puppet zelda is basically it's just pure rng there's no there's no real skill there's not really any skill in this fight so you you need three energy balls you need to bounce back three energy balls to zelda to defeat her so when you bounce back an energy ball you just want to go straight under her and that will make it so that it uh deals her damage immediately and you don't have to do any of the volleying back and forth so the optimal uh amount of cycles for zelda is seven so that would mean, and this would be exactly how it would work. The first attack would be an energy ball. The second one would be something else. The third one would be an energy ball. And then the seven. So that would be optimal seven cycle is one, three, and seven be energy balls. So here we're on three and that's an energy ball. So, so far this is perfect for a seven cycle. Now for the attacks that are not energy balls, there's two different types of attacks and one's faster than the other so you can either get the triforce attack or the charge attack this is the charge attack right here triforce attack is slower than the charge attack you want the charge attack so you seven cycle is optimal but so but there's other things that are important you also you don't want triforces because triforces are slower and every time zelda attacks she can wait a random amount of uh, amount of time between just attack, each attack so you also want the attacks to be fast as well so there's quite a bit of rng in zelda now, luckily, I actually got a pretty decent Zelda in this run. So, uh, Zelda here, I actually, I got a 7 cycle. Is this the 7th? Yeah, this is the 7th. So, that was a really nice 7 from Zelda. It only lost me a few seconds. So, not a bad Zelda fight. Very nice 7 cycle. So, Zelda, Puppet Zelda is down. Next is Beast Ganon. So Beast Ganon, uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can you can stop him from charging, but Ball and Chain is really the best strat we have right now. We're gonna side up out of the way and then Ball and Chain to avoid getting hit. And then now, the way I do these, these, these attacks is really important. I wanna do four regular slashes, and then I wanna do a full combo of another four. And I want all of them to hit. And that's really important. You have to do the attacks fast enough to get that to work. Um, and I wanna do that a second time here. So here I'm going to go into this wall and then wait for for uh, Beast Ganon and then I'm going to throw the ball and chain again. And then again, the same combo. So four regular and then a full combo. And that what that does is that now, uh, after a jump attack, I forgot to mention, it's a jump attack and then four and then four. But that means that now uh, Beast Ganon is one hit away from being KO'd. So that means that this last attack, you have to be Wolf for it. We'll have, he'll not teleport a bunch of times. He actually does that as fast as possible. So if you have him on on, um, on higher health, that actually is a lot slower. But what's really convenient is that not only does that portal spawn really quickly, but also that means that you can you don't have to transform into human. You can actually deal that last hit as uh, Beast, as, uh, as Wolf. So, uh, that's the fastest way to do that fight, is there's that specific way of doing those attacks. So, jump attack, and then four regular stabs, and then mash B for four more hits and do a full combo. And the direction you hold on the combos does matter too, so. So, now we have horseback. So, I'm going to get Ganon into pursuit by making him miss me with a sword, so he's missed me. And now what we're going to do is we're going to follow as close as possible. So what really matters is that we, we aim uh, the horse. Because actually it turns out Zelda's aim is based on the direction the horse is facing. So Zelda shoots directly forward from where the horse is. It's actually a commonly misunderstood thing. So we do spin attacks to hit uh, Ganondorf. And uh, yeah, that is, that is uh, horseback. So pretty good horseback, pretty good late game. This is actually a really good late game for me. I had a pretty, I had a rough start, I will say. 
Uh, that one mistake in Lineru, uh definitely, <laughs> definitely the most interesting where I fell down twice and lost a minute, but otherwise is really good. I'm looking for a sub 250, so unfortunately um, just barely missing the sub 250. It ends up being a 250.09. Uh, but yeah, so the final, the final, the final battle. Uh, basically, we're gonna do a drive-by attack on Ganondorf with our sword to get behind him, and then just jump spin. And then all we we can just spawn camp him. We can just keep getting behind him over and over and over again until the fight's over. And yeah, that's that's Twilight Princess. So um, uh, yeah, I uh, about to head off. This is the rest of the run. Hope you guys enjoyed watching this video. Um, this is a really big deal for me. So um, yeah, if you guys liked the video, please make sure to drop a like and a comment below and subscribe if you haven't. It's Mr. Alberto23 signing off. Hi. Hi everybody.